Hey guys, Jeff here today. I'm at my daughter's house. We're in the backyard. Here's the deal. I got a phone call from them a couple weeks ago and they said, hey, we got a quote to get this fence, 20 feet of fencing and a gate installed. It was gonna be 5,600 bucks. And I said, you guys are crazy. I'm in town, I've got some time. Let me put a material order together and I'm gonna go build you a deck with a privacy screen for the same money. Well, here it is. We got all our material. Okay, I was a little over budget because we went with cedar, $6,000, okay? The whole deck is sitting right here in the backyard. Today's video, we are going to assemble this sucker and show you the power of DIY. Because by the time I'm done, we're gonna have a $35,000 finish value oasis, okay? We're only gonna spend a few thousand bucks on it. Save your money, do it yourself, earn value in your home, okay? Don't let people overcharge you in today's marketplace. You gotta do this yourself. The deck we're building here is on about 400 square feet, okay? So just realistic expectation. In one day, you should be able to set up all of your box frame and all of your floral joist package, okay? Which is important, because when you're all finished, you're gonna wanna take all of your finished deck boards and store them on top of that. Because, well, if you live in the north, you know what happens. You get sun and then rain the next day and so on and so forth. The weather's always changing. Having the grid, the whole floor package built, gives you a place to store your wood on a flat level surface so you can strap it all together and maintain your board so they're not gonna get warped in time. Rule number one when you're putting in a deck is you gotta get rid of the organics. We're talking about grass and all that black earth. The reason that's so crucial is because in a four season climate like we're, we're in, that stuff is gonna rot and gonna break down. And so whatever your deck level is, is gonna be very varying according to how much organics are there and the degree of decomposition. If you remove them, then you have some stability. Now, we're using limestone screenings here. Um, just to create a flat surface in the bottom of the hole so we can set the block. This enables the block to go in somewhat level with really good contact with the ground. There's two ways that you can set your blocks. You can set it on the ground after you remove the, the grass or you can dig it into the hole so you can get the deck closer to the ground. Remember when you're doing a floating deck we've got code requirements. We can only go 24 inches off the ground at any point on the deck. So what we're doing on this side which is the high side of the ground we're putting the block right in the earth. Okay, that way, when we get to the other side, it's raised up and we're not gonna exceed our height requirement. Here we go. Okay. And this next step, <laughs> uh, it's just some small half inch gravel, it's clean stone. And the idea here is, when you dig a hole, sometimes, especially when you're getting started, you can find rocks and have to move your hole and make it bigger or whatever. Have some gravel to backfill. Once you put your landscape cloth on, you won't see the holes. It's kind of dangerous walking around. So just use this just to create a nice safe place to be working. There's no drainage benefit or anything like that here. This is just making sure that when you're working, you're not gonna throw your ankle. That's all there is to it. Next step, grab yourself some landscape cloth. Do a nice overlap, like eight inches. Cover up the area where we're working with these great little pins. Once you've got your ground all covered up, we can start building our box beams. Now, when it comes to spacing, it's really kind of simple. What we're gonna work with is wanting to make everything square. So, for instance, this, these beams over here, these are the first two. We set them up so that they're eight feet apart. The goal here is to have the second set of the structure resting on this, which translates all the load into the post, into the block in the ground, right? So we're gonna have a ridge, we're gonna nail it all together, and we want all these joists to have resting on the box beam, okay? Nice and simple. So really when you're doing this, you're setting up your layout, start from the middle, okay? Find something, measure off from the house the same distance, this type of system is incredibly merciful because you don't have to put the block at the very end. You've all seen the decks where the deck blocks are exposed and they're cutting the skirt around the concrete block. Always looks like garbage. If you do it this way, you can recess this because you can cantilever using two by tens, almost two feet after the block, okay? Gives you a lot more flexibility. It lets you work inside the confines of the perimeter so that you can make adjustments and you aren't gonna have ugly things to deal with later. So as long as your floor joists are on top of the two by tens, we're gonna be fine. That's how you do your layout. I'll show you this. They're a little unstable. 
<laughs> right out of the gate, right? So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to show you a trick to stabilize all the beams, all right? And then we can get the right measurements to continue building. And that is to take one of these two by eights and run it across the entire deck. And we're going to roll it over and screw it to the face. And that will set up our, our depth. That way everything is square. Let's get down dirty here. Now this doesn't have to be perfectly level. It's just to set up like an end stop for the deck. Now we know where the deck ends, right here. So we're gonna cut a couple of blocks. We're gonna set those in, attach the beam, put up against this board so now we know we can keep square. Brilliant little system. And you can make adjustments as you go along, right? Now I need to cut myself some wood. Now, next step with the four by four blocks. When you cut anything structural like this, it's gonna go below grade, especially. But generally, any major structural component, you can see here, this is the pressure treating that penetrated the wood, okay? Didn't penetrate very good on the other sides. So when you cut it, although the surface is nicely treated, now the end cut is completely exposed. The cut and seal is like a sealant. It's a surface penetrating sealer for the wood to provide protection. Take the cut and seal then down inside the block. Now it's unstable, but it's still going to transfer load fantastic. Now we're going to add the two pieces to the side. Here we go. Now, uh, just to keep everybody straight with the lumber, this is a two by 10. Two by 10 is used in construction in homes and can span distances up to 16 feet, okay? It's a 16 foot logging board. So when we put the posts inside a foot or so, you actually have more structure than you have in your house. So <laughs> there's no question whether or not this can carry the load, all right? The only question is, can you put it up in position and get it level all by yourself? That's a trick. This is my two by eight that's attached to my other two boxes. It's gonna be what we're gonna call our preliminary level, okay? And because we're dealing with wood, you never really know. So make sure that your crown is up. And that basically makes sure the board, if it has a warp to it, that it's warped like a rainbow. It'll perform better for you over time. Set a screw, set your depth, which is up against this. And we're gonna lift this up. And what I'm calling this is temporary level because we're just trying to get close. All right. Now, because my screw is so far from the board, I wanted this to end up just a little bit higher. Okay, now that's my temporary level. Now I'm gonna to go to the, the other side. I'm gonna use an actual level on a two by eight to get my right height. Set my screw in advance. This is my straight board that I'm gonna put my level on. You don't have to have a 12 foot level when you're working. With my one hand, I'm gonna raise the two by 10 until the level is in the right spot. Okay, that is where the money is. And then I'm throwing another one just to make sure it's not slipping around. You'll see how far the end dropped. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna adjust this end. So now we're gonna lift this up, flush and square. Second one for the measure. Okay. Again, we're just setting that up, trying to get the depth and get it close to the height so the other side will end up working. We'll come back here. This part is a little monotonous, but if you follow this procedure, works like a charm up to the board. Okay. Very important when you're working, you can't let the box beam roll on you because right now I'm making contact. But when I straighten it up, I'm a good chunk of the way out here. So to keep that from moving, I'm gonna throw a screw into this post. It won't want to roll around so much. There we go. Okay, and now we can come down here and adjust this one. Again, we want to make sure we're square. Okay. 
box bay. Now we're not done yet. Obviously that's no way that's strong enough. What we're doing is we're just throwing in some temporary screws to carry the weight of the board itself. Now we're gonna come by, we're gonna trim off all the tops, seal it all up. And I'm gonna show you my load carrying steel bolt system. That'll transfer 5,000 pounds per post. So you can build whatever you want on here. Here we go. I've just swapped out an eight inch blade for the wood. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the blade flat on the tops and put the plate of the reciprocator up against the board and push. That should keep the machine still, let the blade do all the work. We should be able to cut this nice and flush here. Yeah. Very important to make sure it's at least flush. Don't leave it raised at all. It'll interrupt with the installation of the joist package. And it's okay, like this. Perfect. Whenever you're cutting structural wood, make sure you seal up the end of every cut before you install your posts, okay? Pressure treated doesn't go all the way through the board. It just goes, soaks into the wood on the outside, all right? And then same thing, once you've cut down your posts, you've got to seal anything structural, okay? Be liberal with this. Let it soak right up. It's okay if that stays wet for a few minutes, all right? Because this is going to protect the structure long term and that'll protect your investment. We're gonna just rain this on, okay, to seal it up. All right, well, that's awesome. So now we have three boxes, which is two, one, two stages for the deck. There we go. <laughs> it's a little bit of work with this bit. The key is to constantly clean it out so that it doesn't overheat. All right, now, we put the bolt in. It won't just push through, okay? The hole is drilled perfect to the size of these threads. So we actually have to hammer it in. Now this isn't installed until it's flush with the wood. All right, now it's installed. When it takes that much energy to put a bolt through the wood, you know it's gonna carry the load. You'll notice I'm also about four or five inches down from the top. And the truth of it is, nothing splits when you start far enough away from the top and you seal the wood. Okay. This is the best load transfer system on the market. And we're gonna drive this nut until the washer is flush with the wood. <clears throat> okay. Now it's embedded. That's not going anywhere. 5,000 pounds per post. This deck can carry 40,000 pounds. Nobody has that many friends. So our design has the deck coming through roughly the middle of the staircase. So we're going to remove the steps. Um, luckily for us, builders make them really simple. They make a platform and they make stairs and they just tie it together with a few screws. Now this is just like framing a wall. We're gonna put the ends together. We're gonna to measure our 16 on centers. When you're working with uh, five quarter deck boards, it's actually one inch solid thick. You need a 16 inch spacing. If you're doing a deck like this and finishing with composite, make sure you check with the manufacturer. In a lot of cases, composite requires 12 inch on center because in the heat, it tends to get a little soft and doesn't have the same structural integrity as wood does in the heat. Okay, so you mark the 16s and you throw an X to the right. My tape is little red squares. Makes life simple. So you take your mark joist, walk it over, put it right in the middle mat. A little bit easier. Set it on your post. Same thing over here. Now remember, these boards are the same length as the ones underneath. Okay, so the box beam and your rim joist are the same dimension. So you just line all these up, nice and simple. All right, and now we're gonna fill in the middle with all of our two by eights that we need. Now remember we use two by 10 on the bottom and up here we're using two by eight because our beams are only eight feet apart, okay? Two by eight can span eight feet. If you wanna to go to two by six, you have to build your beams every five feet, 
okay? Or you're gonna have so much deflection, it'll feel like a trampoline. Now, just for simplicity, my first fastener, I'm gonna use a screw, all four corners. This is some have a cage that's not gonna fall all over the place and make a mess. That way I can finish up with my compressor and my air nailer. We're just gonna, boom, pound all these in. Two by eight requires four fasteners on each side. Don't forget that. That'll keep it strong and from rolling over. What I want to do is I want to maneuver everything so that my two or eight, my rims are flush with the ends, okay? And that every joist will be touching a piece of the two by 10, all right? Now we just uh, fill in all the holes. One of the reasons I show people how to make the box beam is you can see the mercy that's involved. This entire structure can be slid all the way over here and as long as each of these joists is a half an inch on top of this 2x10, the load transfer continues all the way through to the post into the ground. So now you can actually measure off the building, put on your triangle, and square off your whole deck on top of the box beams. And then once you've got that where you want it, we can go to the next step. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. If you haven't, we're basically taking measurements 3, 4, and 5. Um, I got hurricane ties. And I love these because if you can kind of get in here into the, the floor joist action. Well, right here, for instance. I can attach it to the 2x10 and to the floor joist, right? And it's not so that it doesn't lift up and blow away with Dorothy and her little dog. It's so that we can establish our square and maintain it while we do the rest of the build. You don't want to trust on a couple of deck screws because they break rather easily. So throw a few of these in. And whenever you're using structure, use structural screws. Why not? At the end of the day, if you don't want something to move because it's going to wreck your life if it happens, you don't trust a deck screw. Deck screws are great when you're dealing with gravity. Keep things from flying around. But we're not dealing with gravity here. We're dealing with shear forces. Somebody um, is working, they bump into the deck. They could knock the structure out of square on us. So we want to make sure we maintain that. And this is the way to do it. And for everybody who hasn't seen this before, this little box comes with its own bit. You buy it right next to the structural nails for floor joists on the shelf at the Home Depot. It's not rocket science, it's a hex head. So it sits right in there. No hammer necessary. This is structure. Put a couple in the bottom, a couple in the top. Generally speaking, you put one of these screws in every hole. When it's designed for structural load and for actual hurricane situations. But for us, it's just keep things square. So two is fine. We'll put one in all four corners and then we're ready to move on. Now, the requirement here for adding to the next stage is really simple. We use the same rim. We don't need another one. All we do is offset or joist. We can nail from the other side, okay? Nice and simple. We're gonna be installing our cedar with a hidden fastener system from uh, what are you talking? Hidden fastener system? Camo screw. Camo screw. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be installing a hidden fastener system from Camo. So the location of the joist doesn't really matter. We don't have to build everything so that, like you do with surface screws. Surface screws, all these joists have to line up. It's all got to be perfect because you're going to see that row of screws. And part of what makes a good deck installation with surface screws is having all your screws in a row. But we don't have to, so we can cheat. We can actually save ourselves a rim joist and offset the installation like this. All we gotta do is figure out how far out we wanna build our deck. Now, because we are, are, are measured off the wall square and our box is now square, I only need to take one measurement, cut every one of these boards exactly the same length and we are good as gold. I got the edge of the house is here and I don't wanna go there. I want just to finish up on the inside of my gas line. Okay, so here's our property line and I'm gonna come out at least 16 inches off the property line, okay? So that my rim my rim is right here. Nice nice and convenient. My deck is only gonna come out to about this far anyway, but it's nice and convenient and it's lined up. So 16 from here, we're just gonna put our tape measure on the wall, rough to mate to my foot, measure back to the foot, seven feet. Well, that's a nice round number. We'll go seven feet, all right? Four by four posts, the same height as the table of the saw, all right? So when you're working mobile, 
<coughs> instant cutting table. Now we're not taking anything for granted here. I'm gonna measure each board at seven feet. Just because it does seem, Matt, like the lumber is a little inconsistent. So, we're gonna bring this down. There we go. Oh, lovely. And of course I'm working with a 10 inch saw today. Then we got our boards cut. Here's the rim for the other side. We're gonna mark this now based off this rim, okay? And I'm just gonna put every board opposite this board. So I have a nice nailing surface. Bugger. Before we put on our rim joists, we're gonna take the end seal. We're gonna finish all these. Whenever you have cut wood, it's always the first thing that goes, right? And this is gonna be part of the deck that no one's gonna see, no one's gonna maintain. But right here is where we're gonna be attaching our privacy screen. And so we don't want that screen to become the weakest link as far as the structure is concerned over time. So take the extra minute. You had to buy a whole can, you might as well use it. <laughs> like, it only takes a couple of seconds to get this done. I'm doing here. There's a little bit more framing we want to do here because this deck, uh, my 16 foot boards, and this is a 16 foot deck, I've got zero mercy for the install. If the boards are the wrong size or they have splits, and a lot of cedar boards have little splits in the end, and it's nice to cut those away. What I like to do is, uh, because we have stairs here, and this whole front is going to be visible from the living room's huge window, right? And then way at this end, we're going to have a step at least one coming off the deck in towards the, the rear entrance. So we want to incorporate a nosing. So we use a technique called picture framing. So all the boards are running this way, but at the very end, we want one board coming this way that overhangs like a bull nose. And so we're gonna frame that up in just a second and show you how to do that. Um, we also have to square off that end because it needs to come forward a little bit. And then we'll anchor that with our hurricane straps. And then we're just going to be loading all of the cedar onto this deck and strapping it nice and tight for when we get a chance to do the install. <sighs> and then the day is done. But first, let's show you how to frame up a picture frame because that'll be crucial. It gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, if your deck is just a little bit larger than the wood that you have available, adding a picture frame gives you another seven inches of dimension. And so it is a really effective technique. <sighs> I'm just going to have a quick break first because... Yeah, yeah. Thank God this backyard gets a lot of shade. But in another hour or two, it's gonna come around the corner here and there'll be no more hiding. Oy. All right, Matt, I gotta eyeball this. I need you to pull that corner forward. Blade's getting done. Well, you know what? That wet wood eats a blade up pretty quick. Yeah. Okay, so we got that. Let's move this out of here. Okay. All right. Every 16 inches. So this is how we're installing our deck boards. Across the joists makes sense, right? But. If you want to have a really nice deck, that's not a finished surface. So we're going to install them around there. And can you help me get that over to there? Uh, right across the front and move that other stuff out of the way. We're just going to get the visual. So, 
So we're framing this up, right? It's rough? Okay. Now, that's a lot of overhang, right? You could step on this and roll. So, that, that's a decent, that's a better looking finish because you don't see the end, okay? Uh, I wish I had just a little piece of this stuff cut off, but I don't. A better way to finish this is actually to bring this up like a nosing, okay? Have about a three quarter inch, all right? And then the best way to finish it is to take some cedar, whether it's the same kind of board or a, like a one by three, and put it across the face for this to sit on, all right? So then you know what that depth is. You add the three quarters plus the three quarters, go to one and a half. You can finish with that and then put lattice to the bottom. That works great. So you don't exactly know where the end is. So when we're putting on our boards, we're guesstimating here, right? So by adding a two by four and then another joist, we've now created this massive amount of meat. So what we're gonna do is always install your board to the middle of the two by four, all right? And then when you're all said and done, you can come by with whatever piece you're gonna put on the edge. You can lay it over on top of all of the wood to the right depth. You can pencil the line because this is going to have its own character. It's going to have its own movement. It's not going to be perfectly straight. You can't chalk line and force the wood into position. It's easier to set it in position, pencil line it, run it with a skill saw, cut all the excess off, and then you just drop this in on some PL Premium. That's how you do picture frame. So knowing the end from the beginning, now you know how to frame it. Outside joist, flat two by four, another joist, nail it all together, install all your boards to the middle, and then you are golden, okay? I'm going to talk about this because some of you are going to be in the comments going, what the hell are you doing that for, Jeff? And some of you are like, oh, that's the right way to do it, Dick. Uh, this is just joist tape, okay? It's just the weatherproofing membrane. It's a one-sided goo. I mean, at the end of the day, because I'm making all this flat stock here, because I'm going to do the um, picture frame, it's going to take forever to dry. Water is going to get held here and trapped here. And so it will be the first place of the deck that rots out. So what I'm doing is I'm adding the joist tape in this area only. Um, my recommendation for the using joist tape is simple. Take a look around. There's no trees. You don't need it, right? Water will fall and, and it'll dry and the air is going to have access to the joist between the gaps of all the boards. Not an issue. If you're in an area where you have a lot of trees, it becomes a little bit different. Now it becomes real vital, right? Because if you're not gonna take the time to pressure wash all of the needles and the leaves out of the joint, all the, out of the joints, that trapped organics when it gets wet really rots. And once you have rotten wood up against fresh wood, the fresh wood starts to rot. So if you don't keep your deck clean, yeah, you know, joist tape. But if you're one of these people that's like, you know, once a month you're out there and you got your pressure washer and you're cleaning out your deck, or if you're in a neighborhood like this with no trees, not necessary. I'm gonna do two runs of it. I don't want my deck rotting prematurely, that's all. And the only reason I really care is because this is a brand new house in a brand new neighborhood with a brand new deck. So, you know, it's not going anywhere for the next, I don't know, 50 years. It'd be nice if it lasted that long. That's like bulletproof weatherproofing here. I'm gonna finish off that. Never used this brand of product before. I'm really pleased. Like it has great adhesion to the other membrane, but gives you a little bit of workability if you mess up your joint. That's awesome. We just got to put all the wood up here now. Okay. Strap it together. Two more here that are good. We lift this up and slide them over. So we know that the first few rows are the all figured out already. Now we can just bring the rest of the boards here. I'm not going any closer 
to the edge here because we got to get in there for the fasteners. So at the end of the day, when you've got your materials all delivered and the weather's looking grim. <laughs> and you know that the weather report is not going to allow you to come back and do any more work on your project for a few days. Here's the solution to twisted wood. Stack it, strap it, don't get stung by a bee. There you go. That's cool. At the end of the day, if you're going to be a few days between jobs, make sure you strap your wood. Uh, it'll really minimize the amount of curving and warping that happens. And it, uh, it makes it a little more difficult for someone to come in your backyard and steal it while you're sleeping. <laughs> this fence is three years old and it is a cedar fence and it's already gone to mold and to fungus. Let's go through the stages because when you got a gray fence, you got to clean it first. We're using this deck cleaner. Basically, it's a bucket of bleach. <laughs> okay, and it's a concentrate. If you read the instructions, it'll tell you if it's not bad, you can mix it one per, one, one per eight. So this is like, what, a gallon? Yeah, you can go one per eight gallons and that's great. And if it's really ugly, you can go one or three. The point is this, bleach, whenever it comes in contact with organic, like fungus and mold, it gets destroyed as it does the killing, okay? If you're not sure and you don't wanna work that hard, just go to one to three, and that's what we're gonna do. We have a major labor shortage, so if you're gonna do anything around your house, consider just getting the job done yourself. Here we go. Don't pour too fast, and pour on the side like this. See, if you go like this, you're gonna get all kinds of air. But you go like this, okay, you got a lot more control, and you're not gonna glug, which means it won't splash. Boom. Remember, it's bleach, so if you're gonna be weird about it and make all kinds of splashing, wear glasses. I'm putting all this in a pail for a reason, because I got a deck brush. I'm gonna stick it on a pole, but here's the deal. My deck brush is a little bit too wide to get in this pail. First order business is cut off a little bit of the deck brush. Ah, this is the perfect size for a deck brush. <laughs> Just a quick note to the guys who make these things. Um, think about it, we're using a pail. Make it fit. What are you gonna do? Put this in a paint tray liner? Mix up just a few ounces at a time? All right, now, now I can get all the way to the bottom of that pail. Good to go. Now, this is really simple. Because it's bleach, the goal really is to get this water from here to the top and let it run down. And remember, some of this might work its way around to the other side of the fence where the neighbor is, but if they're not taking care of their side of the fence, it means they don't really care, so they really don't have a license to complain. All right, now the reason I'm doing this is because I'm gonna be staining my finish deck as well, right? Hard to stain the finish deck if I don't get this cedar change color back to its original glory. Okay, you know what amazes me is in here in Ottawa, all the new construction, they're famous for putting up these cheap cedar fences to separate the backyards from the, the streets and the walking areas and all that sort of thing. And so the entire town is full of rotted out cedar on neighborhoods that are 20 years old. And they're all decrepit and falling down and falling over. But because it's the city's problem, <laughs> they're the ones that have to replace all the fences. So think about it. You got a product that's designed to last 50 years, but they never put caps on them. So the posts rot out pretty quick. And then they don't put any kind of finish on it. So the 50 year wood only lasts 20 years. So you got millions and millions and millions of dollars of cedar fencing all over town. Countless number of trees cut down to make a pretty fence. You know, cedar actually costs almost twice as much as pressure treated lumber. But instead of using pressure treated lumber, they use cedar and then it goes gray. Here, this is a joke. Check this out. This is three years old. Take a look at the stairs that are built off the back of the house. Pressure treated lumber, three years old. You tell me which one you'd rather have as a fence. It is kind of funny though, because at the end of the day, even if it was a pressure treated fence and you waited a couple of years before you put your stain on it, you could still put a cedar color stain on pressure treated and it would look exactly the same. So if anybody knows why the hell we're cutting down cedar to make all of this infrastructure when no one's taking care of it, I would love to know. Because that's part of the reason why cedar's so bloody expensive because they use it in applications like this when no one takes care of it. You know me, on my channel, I like to be practical. There's nothing practical about putting sexy wood on a fence just to let it rot out. Lots of folks out there, they're like, oh, I love the look of grade cedar. I'm like, there's no way in hell you're gonna tell me that's sexy. The only people who like grayed out cedar are either crazy or lazy. But this 
only takes a couple of hours. And you don't even have to wash it like this if you hurry up and get it done when you get a brand new house. Now a couple minutes, we're gonna show you how to stain it. I'm gonna let this all bleach out. I'm starting back at the beginning, just because uh, it works better in the sun. It's not a very sunny day today. So I got enough water here, I'm gonna try to get a second coat. Let's see what we can do. So a lot of you right now are screaming, Jeff, why aren't you using a pressure washer? Well, here's the thing guys. If you use a pressure washer, yes, you'll get it cleaner faster. You're also gonna raise the surface of the grain and it'll accept the stain really nice. Probably accept it better than the deck boards. We're trying to get something uniform, but here's the thing. Look at this neighborhood, 30 units and what? Three acres? <laughs> like think about it. I'm not expecting this. Everyone on the street don't a pressure washer. Now, if you're gonna make a living doing this for people, by all means, get a pressure washer, make your life simple. But the purpose of this video is to empower the other 29 homeowners on the street to fix their own damn fence without having to borrow my pressure washer. <laughs> and if it's this easy, I mean, a little blood, sweat, and tears here, right? Big deal. Yeah, I'm working, whatever. Feel a good, good sweat. I only have to do this once. Now, so you know, I'm at my daughter's house. And she done it when she first got the place. Well, I wouldn't be sitting here scrubbing this thing right now. But everybody has priorities, right? So think about it. If you just bought a house, Maybe make staining your fence a priority so you don't have to go through all this hassle. A good penetrating stain with UV protection is going to last five to seven years before you have to reapply. If you use the right product, you don't even have to sand or wash or nothing. I'm feeling pretty good here. I'm gonna hit that one section one more time and then we're gonna get on with it. And yes, I could have used a paint stick. It's the same thread. And if you're working in a place where you don't have a lot of space, you can't have a big stick. Pick this up, it's like three bucks. You can just cut it in half on your saw. Work with a little one. But I wear gloves if you're gonna be close to that water. Now. Let's take a look at how nasty this is. I'm gonna just pull out the suds here for you. So you can see how incredibly gray this is. You see how much dirt is in there already? That's how much just came off as soon as I touched it with the brush. Can't wait to get a hose on this bad boy. I love how a good solid rubber hose like this, it's like kink free. And then somebody comes along and makes something that looks like a solid rubber hose, but it's, it's kind of like a mixture of rubber and plastic. It's just not the same quality, but designed to look like it. In the old days, if it was green, it was plastic. If it was black, it was rubber. Life was simple. Now they make imitation plastic to look like rubber. Okay, we're gonna take a 20 minute break. Let the bleach do its job. I mean, you can see already here, look at all the crud that's just sitting on the surface waiting to be washed off. Okay, let's be patient, Jeff. <laughs> Sometimes moving forward is moving backward. So obviously this stuff works. Um, the secret here really is pressure, getting in the grooves. And to clean out the grain, you've got to brush with the grain. You'll see the brush lines here when I went the opposite direction. Now I want to get rid of those. So now I've got to get the fence wet, rub with the grain, get everything in the right direction so when I stain it, I don't have brush lines. Okay, so with the board, and you're going to see a bunch of crap coming off, right? That's the, that's the goop that I'm, trying, I'm looking for. And this process isn't without its work. Like I said, if you have a pressure washer, use it. If you don't, you can still get a good result. The goal here is to get the cedar as clean as you can. So when we're done doing the rest of our deck, it's all stained together, looking good. Focusing on the, the tops and the bottoms where all the goop is. Maybe wash my brush too, it's filthy. That's what we're gonna do. <laughs> now that we showed you the basics, we're gonna let the cameraman get out of the way. Matt and I are gonna get busy, and we'll jump right into the stain. Maddie, Maddie. You know what it's taking for me not to do this right you now? You don't have the balls. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is my favorite stain, guys. But if it sits still for too long, like when your videographer gets COVID and you gotta wait two weeks to finish off the project, <laughs> you're gonna find it's incredibly settled. So all of the UV protection is like a paste sitting on the bottom of the ground. It's thicker than toothpaste. So this mixer is just a little redneck, but it'll get the job done. There we go. Watch your feet. Better to have 
80% of your stain UV protection than none at all. Or 70. <laughs> yeah, this is a little redneck, but sometimes the store is just too far away. There we go. I'm happy with that. Let's get to work. All right, so basically the concept is this. You wash your fence down, it starts to dry. You start working where it's just drying out. The wood itself is actually a higher level of moisture at this point. The pores are open and ready to receive a stain. Now we're gonna use what's called a penetrating sealer stain. Quick history lesson, we used to use oil back in the day. Oh, save the planet, we stopped with oil. Then we had to cut down twice as many trees because the fences didn't last because we were using a water-based product. Okay, maybe we go to go back to oil. Then somebody came up with new water-based penetrating stain so we can get rid of oil again. So here we are, flip side. Now we got a product that is water-based, penetrates the wood, and it doesn't skin. Most products that are out there, oil included, skins on the surface. It sits on the surface, okay? There's your oil. Now the water base used to go in there, but it also had a skin. And this is where we ran into problems because water base didn't last very long. And so after three or five years, depending on what surface, how much sun, your geography, it would blister and peel and that skin would come up. And then you'd have to scrape and sand and all that prep work that everybody went mad over. Now we got a penetrating product that goes into the wood without a skin. And so all of the protection against UV rays and everything is happening in the wood. And when it wears down, you'll notice, because when it rains, it's not going to beat up. Okay, you won't get that, that silicone windshield effect anymore. And all you do is you come along and you add one more coat of this product, and it goes back into the wood again, because now it's absorbing product. It'll absorb this another coat. Nothing ever sitting on, this, on the surface. So now when we stain, we never have to sand and scrape ever again. That's what makes this product amazing. That's why it's my favorite. That's why if you're gonna use a stain, use C2 Guard. Pour it into a big pail like this, okay? Use this brush to constantly mix it as you go. This makes a mess, which is why I'm using it on the fence first. We'll do the deck later. And we're gonna use the deck with a different system, so make sure you subscribe to the channel. A lot of really good tips and tricks. It's gonna be a huge deck, built-in benches, uh, privacy screen, we're rebuilding the stairs. Every fire feature, okay, you're not going to want to miss it. So, because it's water-based, we want to start at the top, because it'll always drip down, all right? Now, this is our privacy. This is the property line. And less is more here. You don't want to put too much pressure, all right? And we're going to just wet the surface. It's kind of like painting an in interior wall. You want this brush to be wet enough that it'll, right, drip, but not drip. See that? Perfect. This will keep you under control. Right here. Now, the best thing you can do with this product is do one piece of wood at a time. Because it's a penetrating sealer, you'll get those overlap marks if you're not careful. Whenever you're doing horizontals, nice and clean brush. Make sure you're watching your edge, which is down here. Okay? Again, you're painting from inside. You're not having a ton of excess product. It's not dripping all over. All right, if you're not sure, if you've never done it before, find a discreet place where you can practice a little bit first. Go upside down with a little more pressure, and once it's drying out, if you do upside down first, it'll drip everywhere. And then board like that, the underside of that board, and then do the board. Okay? Nice and simple. All right, this is the whole process. Nothing really to it. Now. You want to stain what I call wet on wet, which means you're going to get two coats of this. Okay, the first one is going to open up the pores. The second coat is going to provide that superior protection that you want for long term. But remember, whenever you touch a piece of wood, you want to finish it or you're going to get overlap marks. All right, because it is a penetrating sealer. And once it penetrates, it starts to seal. <laughs> and so you will get overlap marks. The stain penetrates into different layers of the wood. All right, that's the secret, right there. Now, what I've done is almost three minutes of work. Three minutes is kind of my, my factor on a day like today. Today we're what, in the low 20s, Canadian temperature, uh, probably 80 degrees, okay, in the American scale. So what I'm looking at doing here is about three minutes worth of work. If it's hotter, maybe two minutes. If it's cooler, maybe four minutes, five minutes. All right, give it a chance to absorb in, because this really is just opening up the pores. And when I've done three minutes of work, 
I'll go right back to where I started. It's very important to keep an eye on where your production schedule is here. There we go. Just for good measure, I'm gonna do my last horizontal board. There, that's three minutes. You have an option with this product, these brushes. This is that same universal thread. So you can always go get a big stick if you're not trying to be as precise. Okay, we'll do this post again. Wet on wet. So before it fully dries, you wanna get the second coat on. Okay, and that'll help the first coat to penetrate even deeper. And I know not everybody's gonna treat this like uh, you're painting in your house trim. I like to, just because I know what happens if you get spots on the wood. It shows up a little blotchy. Now a lot of people ask me, where can I go to get a good stain? What do I think about what's available at the box stores? And at this point right now, my advice is really simple. Um, avoid the box store for products like this. And this is the C2, it's my favorite paint, guys. And if you're interested in getting this as your stain, there'll be a link in the video description. Everybody in the United States can get this mixed and then delivered to their house. A can of stain is actually free shipping and 20% off with our code. So I'm gonna recommend it. If you live in Canada, we don't have that service yet. But if you're in Ottawa, head down to Randall's. Say hi to the team down there. Tell them Jeff sent you. All right, up up the coffee. There we go. There you go. Just set it straight down flush. There you go. And we'll just mark that off. There you go. Why is that one so high? Hold on. Um, this is a 10, this is an eight. Okay, now we've got the frame finished. Let's jump into this planing. We've got a few spots over there and one board over here. Every time you buy wood from the store, it doesn't mean it's gonna be exactly the right size, so. Be prepared with a planer whenever you're building a deck. One thing that we just don't want, dude, is we don't want anybody coming on and off this deck at the step and having things bouncy. Some people, Especially when they get older, they get lose their uh, lose the strength in their step, right? So we're gonna put on a hair gain strap just to hold everything nice and tight. And I'm gonna put the screws on the piece that goes down on an angle. And this will just guarantee that it gives a nice pull on the downward force. There we go. Okay, solid as a rock. That's the way I like it. So here on this channel, I like to show you my mistakes as well and how we fix them. And here's one simple one. Once we got all the wood out of the way, we realized that this beam wasn't level. At this back corner, it was, it was a little bit down. And that's just a result of starting in the middle, doing the left, doing the right side, having all the wood stored here on site. You know, you're tripping over yourself sometimes when you have no storage, right? So I wanted to show you this. I'm going from ridge beam to the second ridge here. You can see that I'm an inch short. And this isn't because of the wood's crowned. <laughs> Demonstrate it. This is actually a pretty straight piece of wood. I'm still an inch short. So because I'm an inch short, I'm gonna use just a, a sliver off of one of my deck boards. I know already that because I'm gonna use a nosing across the front, I'm gonna have a bit of trimming to cut off here. Now having this problem actually gives us an opportunity to demonstrate what you do in the springtime. <laughs> After a few years, if you have an issue, Let's take a look at here, landscape cloth. Okay. What we have here is a concrete post that has a one and a half inch gap. And so if we can lift this post, we can slide a shim in underneath. And so since we're an inch short, we're gonna add a one inch shim right here. And we're just gonna use a little bit of leverage. Because we have a box beam, anytime you can grab a two by four or a two by six if you need to, a couple of guys, Lift it up, have someone slide in the shim. No big deal. The worst thing that can happen is it'll fall back into place. <laughs> so you can, you can grab your six-year-old to crawl underneath the deck and do that for you. All right. <laughs> this way, it's not as strong as that way. Okay, so cut your thickness that you want and slide your shim in with the grain facing up. Okay, you want this grain facing up, cut one inch thick this way. So because we're on ground, put a one by eight down, we're gonna go, oh, Get as much leverage as you can. That's good. Okay. And if you can just lift that for me. <clears throat> and up a little bit more. And a bit more. There we go. And boom. Loving it. Let's put that board back on and see how she looks. Ah. Uh oh. 
What do you mean, uh-oh? Now we're low on this side. Really? Yep. Well, then we got to do another shim. Cut another board. If we got the height of the deck wrong, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Let's start over here. I'm going to add my joist tape. Now, if you missed this in the last video, just a quick reminder, the reason we're doing this is because we're going to go with like a picture frame front, which means I can have one board going along this way, so the finish is a beveled edge and a nosing effect, and then we'll tie in all the boards underneath it. Because we're going to have the boards going this way, there's a propensity to trap water here, and we want to encourage a healthy, healthy, strong environment there because it is a bit of a safety issue for people walking on the deck. If the edge of the deck rots out, <laughs> let's just go long and tight. There we are. When you're gonna do the joist planing like this, if you're working as a team, remember, not everybody frames the same. So I know Matt likes to throw a nail from the top on an angle into the rim joist, going this way. So I gave him the marker. He's gonna walk around Identify with a circle any nail head that needs to be sunk and he's going to put an X on the top of any of these That have to be planed. It should just be a couple here. Most of them are over there So I know I got two here three here uh, Maybe four. Okay, here's what a planer is. Um, I know this is on right now, so I'll just keep my hands out of the way Here's the blade right there kids Okay, good planer has two blades like this on the same wheel Watch how fast that spins. All right, do not let that come in contact with any part of your body. All right, the way the knob works is this. Zero, right here, down on the bottom. And we have all kinds of adjustments. 164, like just minor stuff, right? Now, in most cases, 1 16th of an inch means 18 of what I'm gonna take off makes one inch. That still looks pretty non-aggressive. And for what we're doing, I'm gonna go in half of that, 1 32nd, and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the high spot. And if it doesn't feel like it's very high, I'll just start about a six or eight inches out, okay? Notice the back here, that'll sit high on purpose. So you wanna start back, you roll forward, and then you wanna turn the trigger on, and then just push. It's still not flush, I'll go back another few inches. And that'll end up graduating that plane till it's nice and flush. That's all it is. Now this only takes a minute, but it's the difference between a great job and an okay job. Okay. Remember, we're painting for effect here, not for presentation. Stir the bottom in as you work, guys. Make sure you're getting the, all that goodness in there, okay? There's no such thing as putting on too much of this stuff. This little jar here probably will cut the end of three, four hundred boards. Okay, so you don't, it's not like you're going to run out. You want to put it nice and liberal on there. Let the wood soak it all up. Okay, here we go. Beautiful. Inevitably, somebody's gonna be like, oh my God, you're weakening your wood. Yeah, right, okay, I'm, so I'm taking an eighth of it off. The point is, is that this is a two by eight, and a two by eight floor joist can span 12 feet. We're only going eight feet box to box. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that I'm gonna have plenty of structural strength. This is one of the reasons why you don't wanna go undersize on your wood when you're building, because then you really do put yourself in a situation. Like if I use two by six, I'd have to have a beam every five feet. And then if I started doing this, man, that's gonna be dramatic, right? Because it's, it's not about I'm taking an eighth off, it's the percentage total of the thickness of that board. That would be an issue. Oh, and just a reminder, the reason this is necessary is because it's a box beam, which means I have two pieces of wood, both on a post, and they have their own different crown situation. 
okay? So meeting in the middle, um, it is possible for one side of this board to be higher than the other. And so when you're building, just don't worry about it. Just keep moving forward. Come back, this takes 10 minutes. As we're right putting on our deck boards, if we get to a point where the water is gonna land right where everything is nailed together, it's probably not a great idea because you don't wanna have all of the ends of your fasteners exposed to all that rain. So if it's gonna be a joint, I'm gonna cover that in joist tape, just to give a little extra protection. This is the location I'm talking about. So if I have my two deck, deck boards and they land right here, for instance, that means all those fasteners and where they enter and come out of the wood on both sides, it's exposed to extra water and I can't seal that. So if that happens, I'll throw a joist tape right down the middle. It's a water diversion system. The deck boards might only last 50 years, but the, the frame itself probably will last 100 if you take good care of it. <laughs> That's the secret. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you the plan for the deck. Here's the corner. That's me right here, okay? <laughs> this is the box beam, and here's our floor joist. What we're gonna do is when we're finished putting all of our boards on, I'm gonna have an inside table here. I'm gonna build in a custom eight foot sofa on each side, and then we're putting a fire pit right here. <sighs> so my goal is to then now identify where this location is, because I wanna have my gas line come underneath the deck and come out of the deck right here. Generally speaking, when we do this, my gas guy, he's like, you need conduit. And so inch and a half ABS works great. Uh, try to find inch and a half ABS at the store right now. Maddening, so we want two. Spending more money than we need to, but it'll be easier to pull. And so if this is the whole deck, our gas comes off the house over here. So we're gonna run it, conduit, all the way to this location. We'll attach it to the frame using galvanized strapping and we'll put a line in it, but I gotta figure out this location. So, my benches are 18 inches deep, and that takes me to here, and then I wanna have at least two feet from the bench to the fire table, and even that seems a little bit close. We'll go 30 inches. Okay, so this is my 30 inches off of here, and I'm doing exactly the same thing over here. Bench, space, so we'll go four feet. That'll be to the edge of the fire pit. Haha. -ha. But my fire pit is also a 32. So right there will be my measurement to the middle. So I'm going to 64 inches from both directions. This choice is going to come in real handy. So there's the middle. So what I'm going to do is bring my pipe underneath to here, throw an elbow on it. That way when and then when it's time, we'll be able to cut a small hole in this area, and then we can pull the soft copper pipe all the way through for the gas line, put a fitting on it, flare it, connect it with a flexible hose, drop the fire pit in position on a finished deck, and it won't be of any consequence because the pit is gonna go from here to here. And so all the weight will rest on these joists, and this one will just be for show. <laughs> okay, good to know the end from the beginning. Now I've got location. Just gonna glue together some pipe real quick, throw in a couple fittings, run my string. That was the third thing I have to do, and then it's time to start decking. Can't wait today because we're gonna use the camo fastener system. I'm gonna show you how pretty it's gonna look. My design versus a traditional just straight board install. All right, let's get at it. Ah. All right, so I'm gonna tie a deck screw to the end of my string, just so I got some gravity working in my favor. I gotta go 12 feet. There it is. Got a coupling. And then I'm gonna have one more piece of pipe, but I gotta measure that off first. So, let's take the total length of the deck, which was eight feet, 15, 15 feet. We'll finish the pipe underneath the edge here, because then I can put a skirt on and have the condo hidden. So it's 15, and then this is Sixty-four, ten, seven, fifteen feet, twenty inches, three feet, four foot eight. Um, four foot eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm going to cut it a little bit short because I'm going to use long sweeping elbows. Okay, let's get that on the string. Pipe, elbow, coupling. Okay. 
And just because I know my gas guy, when he's finished, he's going to use silicone to seal it all up. I bought a bushing so it doesn't have quite such a huge hole. So I'm going to glue this together and feed it underneath the deck. Piece of cake, really. Now, this does not have a requirement to be waterproof, per se. So I'm not going to do adhesive on the fitting and the pipe. I just need this to hold up underneath the strength of running that line. Now, I'm not sure what it's like where y'all live, but where I'm from, as long as you have a gas technician running the line to this scenario, I don't need a permit. Just got to follow the rules. Unfortunately for me, Brad, my gas guy, B-Rad, he's the one that did our gasoline for the fire pit at the farmhouse. If you're not familiar with our channel, yeah, renovated an entire 1880 farmhouse from top to bottom. And we put a fire feature in that one. Okay, here we go. He told me over the phone, just go run your ABS pipe. Gave me the depth because there was going in a patio. My understanding with this kind of thing is as long as a conduit is attached to the structure, there's no issues. <laughs> so, fingers crossed. When he gets back from vacation, we'll find out if we did this right. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel and follow along with the journey. Because I might have some egg on my face. I might, uh, might be crawling around underneath this deck later on. <laughs> Making some adjustments to my structure here. But uh, I like to have the end from the beginning, guys. You know that. But in this particular case, this is just a good educated guess. I'm not bothering him on vacation to find out. Okay, so before we glue this elbow, we're going to slide this all the way along and see if we're feeling lucky. Ouch. What are they? There we go. Other side. I got a lot of wood here and I don't know why. I hate a messy job site. All right. Okay, so that's that's good here. If I was to turn it underneath, because I'm going to build a little two by four frame here, hang some square lattice off it, just so that the neighbor kid balls don't go running underneath. I don't need them crawling underneath my deck. Okay, let's go see how that turned out. Okay, so this is a good location. I'm going to show you one other trick to keep water from filling up that line while we're waiting for gas guy to come, and that is this. I'm just going to take a piece of joist tape and seal the end of that pipe. We can keep water out. Okay. Oh, I got to get this to play ball now, don't I? I got lucky. Okay, right there. Beautiful. I'm um, also going to throw a screw in the side of this joist and hang the string off of it. Here we go. Now, I've already got my screw. Problem solved, right there. So now we, it's not going to fill up with water. It's in the right location. The screw's going to make sure I don't lose that string. 64 inches out. I'm just going to grab my camera, take a picture of this measurement so that I can remember later on to come 64 and 64 to drill that hole. Life is good. Every time you close that up, it gets almost impossible to open again. Okay. Make sure that my pipe there is facing up. Now, I can put this one on. Okay, here we go. Of course, it's got to be tighter than that. I'm going to twist here, make sure everything's nice and glued up. And one more coupling over here. That's enough for now. I'm on the exposed side of the deck. So I got no problem coming back to finish this off. Once Brad's in town, <clears throat> as you can see, just on the other side of the barbecue is the hookup hook for the barbecue. He's going to split that line so the barbecue can be, can be on top of the deck. The other line can feed into here. And I'll wait for him to tell me what I need for requirements going back to the house. I might have to add another two by on the end to go all the way to the house, maybe even on a post. I'm not sure. I'll wait for him to tell me about that. In the meantime, let's get going on the decking boards. It's about time. There's a couple of things we want to go through real quick. Let's just take a look at here's a here's a standard installation. Nice and simple. If you make your deck 15 feet and 8 inches long, you can go to the 16 foot board, have a little overhang, just install them straight, right across. And that's what that looks like. Uh, not terrible, but all of these end cuts are in the made in the factory, and they're not clean, and they'll stain a lot different than the surfaces. So it can be a problem. What I like to do is this way, add the nosing, which is why we built out this box, out of the tape, add the nosing. And then before we install all the boards, we're gonna take our palm sander. We're actually gonna round all these edges and clean this up as well. That makes all of this super sexy. 
and then I can set my nosing for the depth that I need. Now in this case, for the purpose of the demonstration, I put it in a little deeper, but I am going to bring it out a little bit further, and I'm going to rip one of these boards in half and stick it underneath. And then from this point down, I'm going to add a lattice to close off the bottom. Okay, so we're going to intentionally install this a little bit deeper than we need, so that the end result is something like this. Looks a lot like a stair. Then we can build a box step here, and it'll be look real natural, and that'll be it. So it's just a matter of getting a layout that you like, making sure that you install your boards like rainbows, not like happy faces. Take a look at the grains. This one would be officially upside down, because that's a happy face. What happens here is this little knot in the middle, this piece, ends up lifting out and gets a little bit of water in there, and over time you get slivers sticking out. So these boards need to be flipped, okay? And we've got to identify, looking for rough surfaces that need a little palm sander work. This is a rainbow as well, rough surfaces. Probably a good idea because the place I go to buy my cedar, they always get the best stuff that's available in the country. There's a relationship with the owner and the mill. Even with that, you're still gonna get some edges like this, okay? The trees were cutting down, getting smaller and smaller every year. Try to incorporate some bench seating or make your deck a little bit shorter than what you need so you can cut off some of these rough edges. The worst case scenario, if you had to, absolutely, and you installed it this way, just, just realize <laughs> when you install it as a happy face, you are probably going to get cupping like this, like the happy face, okay? Remember, cedar's a softwood lumber. It likes to twist as it grows, and it has this natural tendency to want to warp. So it's going to cup like a happy face, or it's going to cup like this. It's going to get pronounced, okay? This gets rid of water. That holds water. And when you hold water like this, this little bit right here ends up sitting underwater for a long period of time. And if it's in the shade, it'll end up lifting. No amount of stain and sealing is going to protect you from that. Um, you probably have to do maintenance on it every single year, if that's the case. All right, so in order to set this nosing up, remember I'm going to take one of these five-quarter boards. We have at least one of them here that's like a real hockey stick. And when you cut it down the middle, it creates a nice little one and two and a half inch piece. Um, but that's one inch thick. So I want a three-quarter inch nosing, which means if I come off the edge of my deck here, because I'm going to be adding that bench seating, one and three quarters. I know it sounds aggressive right now, but right here is the perfect location, okay? And then I'll add that other piece after the fact. Now, I'm not a big fan of this. Generally speaking, I like to use um, the camo screws. I'll show you how that works in a minute, but it doesn't show any surface screws. But in this case, in this situation where I'm creating a nosing, I want to have a big head with downward pressure into the lumber, and I'm going to use a regular deck screw. Make sure you buy the brown. They make two colors. They make brown and green. In the old days, the green was for pressure treated lumber because it was treated with green stuff. And then we had brown for cedar. Now, even the pressure treated is brown. So if it's not a hidden fastener, make sure you're getting the right color screw because after the sun gets to it for a while, you don't want to have a bunch of little green dots all over your deck. <laughs> that would look kind of silly, wouldn't it? Um, we're going to come back a few inches, three or four, one inch off the wood, four inches off here, in reverse. Burn that a little bit. And go perfectly flush. Or maybe just a touch of a dent. You don't want to hold in too much water. At the end of the day, this is the weakest spot on the deck. So how this one board performs is crucially important. Now what you want to do is you want to go every 16 inches. Okay? You want to measure. Am I still at one and three quarters? Right? And in this case, I'm not. I'm way up. Okay? And you want to put that screw in every 16 inches. And you don't want to get a sliver. Okay? If you go too deep, the wood fibers will break off and then stick up in the air. And then people will be using your deck and their bare feet. Because people still do that. And they will get slivers. And they will get infected. And when they wake up the next morning, drunk on your floor, they're going to be like, oh, my foot hurts. What did you do to me? And it'll be all your fault because you didn't take the time to set the screws to the right depth. <laughs> okay, see that? Those fibers are dangerous. Okay. Now, the next step, 
course, after you get your nosing set up properly, is to set up the camo screws. We use a separate bit. Make sure you buy the camo bit. Don't just try to find something in your toolbox that kind of works. It'll end up stripping. And the tool and the, the bit driver work together in harmony. Okay, so it's the, the kind of shaft and where the location for the finish is as well. Um, I'll just demonstrate that on real wood. Why not? Uh, here's the screws. They come in two different sizes. The short screw is French English. One and seven eighths. Okay, it goes off the, off the board like that around the corner, okay? And then it goes into the joist down here. And then when it's fully engaged, the screw will be down here like this, underneath the surface of the wood, okay? And you'll have one on each side, causing that pinching action to keep the boards from warping. It's actually a really efficient system because the downward force is the whole shaft of that screw. And it's designed so that it drills in here and the threads reverse here to pull that board tight to the joist, okay? So you don't get loose, slabby boards. It's amazing. Now, you don't need the real long ones. The real long ones are if you're using two by six lumber because it's thicker wood. Short screws are fine, save your money. You're not getting any advantage buying the longer screw. All right, we've already identified all the boards and where we want to put them. This board has a nasty piece of damage here. Can't use this board unless I flip it. Ah, and at the very end is damaged, but it's going under my benches. This will work fine. I've got a couple of rough spots here I'm gonna clean up and I'm gonna definitely polish the end. All right. Now, that polished edge up against the next deck board with a small gap for expansion and contraction looks amazing. You get this bevel, it's the same bevel that's gonna be on the rest of the boards. That way, I'll just show you how pretty that is compared to that. Which would you rather see on your deck? In order to get an excellent job, you're gonna need a chalk line to start. First board we're gonna put on that chalk line, we're gonna manipulate it into position. We don't really care how the board feels about it. We're gonna need a two by four, small section, okay? Because what we can do is we can throw a screw on that and we can use this to push and force the boards close without causing damage to the wood. The wood of wood contact leaves a just really small amount of damage. Easy to sand out if you have a really stubborn board. Um, other than that, get your screws, get your camo gun and your palm sander and be, uh, be patient. This doesn't take forever, but it sure takes work. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw this bad boy on the inside edge and see if we have a straight line. That looks really good, eh? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna switch back to a couple of surface screws on the outside edge, and I'll tell you why. The camo screw, because it goes on an angle, every time there's a gap between the two boards, it'll pull or push, okay? Once you've got the first board in, it's easily manageable. Okay, so. By going straight down on the end, I'm able to make sure that this board isn't going to be moving around on me. Minimal amount of surface screws. And I'm also going to have that corner table and then eight feet of bench here. So I'm only going to have two visible screws on this whole board. Now I'm going to have a straight surface that I can manipulate. That's awesome. And anywhere and I'm not gonna have visible screws. I'm gonna use a surface screw under the bench because the bench is gonna provide us so much protection anyway. Against the UV, it'll never decay underneath that bench faster than it will in an open space. You're gonna to wanna to do at least your first row of screws on surface screw anyway. So start in the most um, non-visible location. In my case, because I'm having benches, this is the most non-visible location. This allows me to use all the bad wood and start with surface screwing. You'll see in a minute when we start putting those warp boards up against it, why having something straight to start with is so important. Now here comes the trick if you're working alone. You're gonna have your camel. Go out and get some of these empire squares, okay? The little eight inch or whatever they are. Six, seven, eight, six, seven inch. They have the same diameter or same thickness as the camo. So what you do is you start off over at your end. You start off by pulling the trigger and this gets wider. Okay, watch this. Okay, so it won't fit on the board. Now, and you release and it grabs the board. Okay, 
Now, automatically you set your space. So I can push it like that, all right? And I wanna just leave a little bit of a hair, just enough so that it feels like there's a little bit of expansion space there. At the end of the day, it can expand all it wants out the other end. But I want this tight. And this is what I was talking about, having the surface screwed straight. Right now, because I have that, I can put that wedge there and I can start by screwing on this end in this direction. So we'll pull the board in that direction against a board that's not going anywhere. You drop your screw in, you set your bit on there, and you just push while you screw until this ridge of the shaft hits the surface. That's it. Not going any further, okay? Now, that is what we call the surfaceless screw because it's on the side. You catch that okay? Yep. All right, now, if you're working alone and your board's not straight, as you can tell, this one isn't, right? It's not bad for a little while. You can throw a square over here, pull the board open, and if you grab a couple of them, pull in there. Now you'll see the benefit. Need a couple of these. Okay. So I've got this to establish my gap, and every few feet or so, I'm gonna come along, hold that board shut, drop that screw, and allow that angle. If I wanna make it tighter, I just lift the edge. I can lift the edge of the board. Just a touch. Pull out my square, and then finish driving it home. It's really that simple. It is really sloppy here. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing. When you're working alone, you don't have to have extra hands. You try to set your screw, it's sloppy, Lift the front edge, okay? As much as you want it to go this way, you lift it up here because it's a law of triangle. If I want to close an eighth of an inch, I got to lift it up an eighth of an inch. Now it's set in the wood. Get rid of that screw. Just watch it drive it home. And it pulls it tight. Problem solved. Once I got that gap consistent, and now it's also a straight board. Then I can come back on every board, okay? Like for instance, Right here where the gap is right. Now I can load both ends and just go back and fill in all the screws. The angle's always perfect. The location's always perfect. The shaft means you finish the right depth. Having that silver plate at the bottom and contact front and back means that everything is in the perfect location and both those screws will drive perfect every time. It's idiot proof decking, really. This is how you can make the nicest deck in the neighborhood. Now, of course, if you don't want it to be so difficult, you can leave a bigger gap. If you put it out and you start on this side, you're always pushing the board away a little bit. You're never going to get stuck. You're never going to get jammed in. It all depends on your personality. If you want to have it perfect or if you'd like to just get it done. <laughs> Both work. One more thing I'm going to show you and then we're just going to jump into time lapse. This is a really easy system for getting things done. You put a screw near the edge. Okay. And you can see that I need to close this gap up. And this is fantastic. If you don't have... Whoop, I got structure in the way. Let me fix that. If you don't have incredible amount of strength and you're looking for a way to get multiply your strength, here you go. Good old fashioned lever. You hold up to the top and this gives you the power of 10 men standing here pulling this close. You can do it with one finger. Okay? That's a lot of power to manipulate the wood. So much power. You can put the camo on, drop in my screws. I can just close that gap to where I like it. Drive it home. So for anybody who's driven around and you've seen decks and you've taken a look at what other people are doing, you know, kind of dream building, you'll see this kind of a system put together. It's basically, it's a preformed bracket that forms the bench and the back of a bench. We're sexing it up a little bit, dressing it up a little bit. I'm using a better material. First of all, let me just run through that. This is Select Cedar. And if you go to a nicer store than the box store, you'll be able to order this. They'll have it in stock. This is a one by six select. It's a higher quality than the fence board, right? So basically it's not clear cedar, so it still has a few knots. So it'll mimic what you see on the floor, but it's the same quality as what's on the decking board. 
And this is the kind of product you want to use for anything that's horizontal, like a fence or a bench, all right? So don't just go buy fence boards. They're super thin, they're super flimsy, and they're super cheap, and they're not as good a grade, and it won't stain this good. Now, it's still pretty affordable, relatively speaking. Remember, I'm going to build this table in both benches. That's 16 feet of couch, and it's uh, the wood was 800 bucks, so that's just a few hundred dollars a couch. Not a bad deal. Very affordable. A lot more affordable than a lot of the outdoor furniture you're going to find out there. And this is going to last 30 to 50 years, not just a couple of seasons, when then all the wicker comes undone, right? We built this deck um, off right off the rim joist here. So my structure and my frame is good on this side, but on this side, because we built the nosing, and just in case you haven't seen the, how we built this deck, it's important. It's part of the aspect of this. We'll put the link in the video beneath. But this area here is overhanging, and it's where we put all the splits and everything else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim that back to my rim joist, okay, so that I have structure on both sides to attach all my brackets. I'm just going to put a pencil mark. I'm going to look at the gaps, and I'm going to line up the black mark on my saw, which is where the cutting happens, with where the rim joists are as I go along. It should be that simple. Yeah, that's pretty good. So we know the approach we're gonna take. We gotta have a plan though. We need to know the end from the beginning. So a couple of factors. One, this is the bracket. Two, it's not a very deep bench. And my daughter sent me pictures of the cushions that she's buying, and it's from the Home Depot website, and they're 18 by 46. So we got a depth and we got a length. Now, all of my lumber comes 48 inches, and that's nice. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna build 48 because the cushions for the back are actually a different dimension, and they actually finish up right at eight feet. So the base only go 46 inches, but the tops go to 96 inches. So that only goes 92. So it's a bit of a weird oddity. We're gonna build in an armrest on the right side to adjust for that so that all the cushions fit perfectly. But the idea here is we're going 18 inches. This is only 10, we gotta add eight inches. So since I'm gonna go with that, because the back is on an angle, I'm going to be measuring from here. That is 10 inches across the top. So I need 18 in total. So I'm gonna add eight inches to this. That becomes the depth of my bench. And that is 16 inches from the edge. All right. So here's my corner. I'm going in 16 inches for one bench, in 16 inches for the other bench. And then over here, we're going to build a table. What I'm going to do is I'm going to measure from here now, 18 inches over. That's my mark. Okay, we'll go in both directions. Okay, so if you're not sure, you can't find your mark, put a big V on it. It's a great way to be able to identify where your mark is down the road. Now in a perfect world, we would install these. There's a couple holes here and you'd find a floor joist and that's great. Reality is because it sits in the middle of the board, I'm comfortable just screwing these right in place. And if I can get some floor joists involved, that'd be great. But on this side, there's no floor joists. So if it's gonna work over here, I don't have to be paranoid about where the location is over here, but I do wanna have these basically every 16 inches. Okay, so I'm gonna leave room for the inside table and we're going to go mark this right here. And we're gonna just go like this and put the bracket on the side. And then the end will be there at 96. There we go, that's tons of seating, all right? Now, these brackets come engineered. It's important to know that. There's a hardware package that comes in them. And they come with screws that are designed to go with this bracket into your deck surface. And it's engineered to be a safety device so that you can use these on decks that are higher than two feet off the ground. For us, we don't care. We're not on permit, we're under two feet from the ground, but we're still gonna use the same hardware. Um, you're gonna need to get yourself a couple of tools in order to install this properly. But no big deal. We're gonna jump right in and get all these brackets in play because there's no reason to wait. All right, and there's also locations on the back as well. Let's throw all of the brackets in. We'll measure off for the other bench. We'll finish cutting the deck and then we'll jump into making the table because this has to be made separately and then we're gonna drop it in place. Uh, just a quick note. If you're, if you got a knot in your wood, don't try to drive the screw through it. All you're gonna do is cause a big split. What we're gonna do, is I'm just gonna line up a little bit behind, about an inch off the front of this one, and I'll drive it here. 
not perfect, but it's a lot better than trying to drive it or not. It'll end up breaking. You won't get any support from it anyway. To make an assumption that everything that you buy is the same dimension that it says on the on the little t tab at the store is wrong. A lot of this lumber will come from the mill and the ends will be cut on an angle. So you want to really just adjust. If you're going to buy eight foot lumber, then take a quarter, maybe even a half an inch off of your, off your length and give yourself that room to be able to square off the ends of the lumber so everything looks nice. I went out and bought 10 foot boards. I'm going to cut them perfectly square to eight and then I'm going to use the leftover to wrap this side. Okay, so it'll, it'll have this closed off look. So I'm fine with that but I am gonna be careful to set this right at eight feet. So I'm gonna measure off, there we go. I'm just gonna to try to really pay attention to my order of doing things. I get a two by four that comes in the back of this slot and it follows my arm on an angle, so for a backrest. And as soon as they're installed, I can't be here. <laughs> so I gotta kinda of install those on my way out, which means it's probably best for me to build this inside table get this in place, screw it in place, and then I can continue working on the rest of these benches from the surface of the deck. Okay, so we're gonna go 18, 18, and then 18. That makes that my corner. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw this out. So using both squares, I can measure a four inch face and I can measure to my point on the outside of that. So it's squared off. So this is three and an eighth. That is three and an eighth. And if I line this up, I'm off just a little bit. Two and seven eighths. You see how this works? This is my point that I'm measuring. And there's four inches there. That's pretty close. So we're gonna go with that line. Okay. Ah, oh, beautiful. That actually doesn't make any sense. I'm building this all out of two by fours. So if I go with a three and a half angle, it makes more sense. Let's do the same thing, three and a half. Two and three eighths. Three eighths. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so there's my inside corner. And don't worry about any of this. We're gonna just use a palm sander to get rid of the pencil marks. We're good to go. So now I've got something I can actually measure. So if I'm gonna put a two by four here, okay, that's my two by four, and it's squared off, then I know I need to have a 45 degree cut on this piece of lumber to build that wall, and a 45 on this lumber to build this wall. If this is my deck surface, I want to have my frame standing up so that I can attach my boards horizontally, okay? So, I'm not going to think of this like a um, top and bottom frame. Instead, what I have to do is, I have to think of this in terms of just four corners. Whew. Adding this little detail here is going to make this really, really irritating. I think I'm going to keep it simple. Why complicate my life? It's not going to make that much of a difference. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to think about this. Here's the bench height, okay? It is 15 and a quarter plus one inch because five quarter deck boards, which we're gonna use for the bench seat, just to give it enough strength to transfer the load, um, is one inch. So we're gonna go 16 and a quarter high. And what I wanna do is I wanna have this table high enough that when the deck boards come across, the deck boards come into the cedar and then the table is a little bit higher, okay? And that'll help frame the cushions. So what we're gonna do is take this measurement plus three inches, let's say. Okay, 15 and a quarter, plus one for the wood, makes 16 and a quarter, plus two more inches to keep the cushion in where it belongs. That makes it 18. Now, the good news is, is my cedar is five and a quarter wide. So if I go five and a quarter with a quarter inch gap, which is the thickness of my pencil, which makes this easy, then I'm gonna go five and a half, five and a half, 16 and a half. Three boards takes me to 16 and a half. 15 and a quarter, 16 and a quarter. 
It's not quite high enough for what I want to do. But I want the boards to look like they're wrapping around. So one, two, three finishes at the right height here. So if I want this table higher, I almost need to go a full board higher. Let's do that. I think I'm going to like that more. Five and a quarter plus a quarter is five and a half is 11 is 22. So we're going to go 22 inches high. I'm just going to cut four two by fours at 22 inches. I'm going to cut a bunch of boards um, that are the full one by six that my outside dimension. We're going to go 18. And because I like it to be super sexy, I'll just use the miter saw. We're going to cut everything with a miter joint in the end to meet nice and clean. Anyway, enough talking. Let's do it. All right. Cut 22. And of course, anytime you cut pressure treated lumber, take time to add the cut and seal to the end. The cedar, even when it's cut, has got the same longevity, but the pressure treated, it will rot out early. And then there's no sense putting cedar on your deck if you're not gonna seal up your pressure treated lumber. Okay. There we go. Mission accomplished. All right, now let's cut our cedar. So what we're gonna do is cut it long on purpose to 19. That way I can add the miter after the fact to all the boards and they can all stick out a little bit longer than the frame itself. I'll show you when I assemble this, how this makes sense. 19, 20, 38 and change. That's enough for that. These two are now shorter. Put them over here so don't forget. A lot of cases these boards aren't flat. They've all got a bit of curve. All right. So when you're building something like this, consider if you're going to put a miter on it, okay, and the curve is this way, you want the miter based on the, on the middle of the board so that they can be pushed together. All right. This isn't about getting it perfect. This is about getting it so close that no one's gonna really care how perfect it is. It's gonna be that close. All right, here we go. And... Great. I'm dealing with a 10 inch saw. Doesn't cut all the way through. That's okay. We're just going to go through them all. Let's just get this done. That's why we cut them 19. Give us a little bit of flexibility. You know, the funny thing is, is I was going to be using one by fives instead of one by six. When I went to go pick it up, they were out of inventory. And I forgot to adjust the fact that I only had the 10 inch saw on site. And I didn't bring the 12. Okay. Now this is the one aspect of the job that um, most people will ignore, but is the most critical, is always sand your product before you screw it all together or nail it together. All right, it's almost impossible to do a good job of this without taking care of it first. And if you're happy with the condition of the wood when you attach it, you'll be happy forever. But if you're not, it's really difficult to get the sand in, in between all these gaps and grooves. We're talking about sanding the edge and just softening up the edge. You don't want to have an exact point, okay? And then take a look at the other end. That's going to be visible. There we go. So I'm going to be building on the box. Here's why. Basically, the deal is this, uh, site protection. Five bucks, you can buy a cardboard box and guarantee that you're not going to cause damage to the cedar. Uh, the tools, the, you know, the, all the rough and... The, the little stain on the end of this, it's gonna take an hour to dry. So it's just nice to be ahead of the curve here a little bit. Make a template here real quick. Okay, now this I'm gonna just use as my template to identify where I want my end. And we're gonna be using the hidden fastener. Where does the surface screw? This 
This is basically the system we're going to use on the entire bench today. Okay. And the reason we're using that is, once I get it all installed, I'll be able to hose down the furniture. That high level of moisture will swell the wood and cover the holes. Somewhere over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to come back around and we will add the stain. But in the meantime, there's a couple of weather systems in the forecast, and that is good news for us. That's going to allow us time for this hole to swell shut. Okay, so just beneath the surface, that easy, right? Now time for the next piece. Now these screws have a remarkably unique situation. They're cut off at the tip. So they actually pre-drill as you're screwing. So you don't split the wood. And that's what you get as a finish. That's not bad. Okay, so I'm gonna just put on the rest of the boards. Add the other corner and then i'm going to um, put the fourth post in the back here we're going to have to square this off get it in place and then we're going to cap the top of this with cedar as well here's the million dollar system for doing this you ready two carpenter pencils carpenter pencil is a quarter inch thick on the flat it's a half inch that way but we're done everything based on the quarter inch and it's easier to work with okay so i'll line this up take my cheat piece Work out my outside corner, and then drive some screws home. This couldn't be any easier. You don't have to be a woodworker to make this furniture. Best thing about this screw is this side is designed to drive into the wood, and this is reverse threaded and it pulls the surface tight. That's how you get this amazing result. I'm going to try to make this square if we can, 17 and a quarter, because that's going to make a difference when we go to cap it. Here we go. Now there are faster ways to build stuff, but if you want sexy, you got to take your time, build slow, and then you'll be just fine. Remember, this isn't rocket science. It's just patience. That's really the only gift you need to be able to do this. Here's another secret for you. Create a hole in the wood with the bit before you start. It doesn't run around as much. You know what? This is also a hell of a lot easier if things are not moving around. There we go. Now we're not gonna be moving. Okay. I'm just using two and a half inch screws, a couple of 18 inch piece brackets. I'm gonna go this way with the finished cedar. So I wanna try to get flush with the top here. Do it on both sides. And that will be it for the table. Piece of cake, eh? 18, 19, 22. Yeah, we're gonna build just a bit of a nosing. And what that means is I'm gonna build the top a little bit bigger than down here. Same thing, I'm gonna need four pieces. Yeah. All right. We're gonna go 20 inches. Where are we? These are what? Five and a quarter times four is 21. If I go 21 on here. Yeah, we'll go 21. And then the top will be square. Most of the overhang will be off the back of the deck anyway. But it'll all look very intentional when I'm done. 
most practical way to build anything is to build it based on the size of the material. That way you can avoid the need for a lot of extra tools. Yeah, we'll clean up the ends as well, because they'll stain a lot better if they're square. Okay, Whew. same rule applies. Gotta sand everything we touch. No, I just want to be thinking really clearly about this. Because I've got a sofa coming into the end on both sides. So if I'm not flush, I have to cut all of my other boards around this. And that's going to look like hell. Rethinking, going square. And we're just going to make the table bigger than the surface. Okay. That's still doable. All right. Now, same hardware applies. And this table isn't square right now, but it can be. I gotta just force it. So we're going to line up along this edge first to my point and put screw on the back. finish screwing this line first and then I'll make the adjustment for a square let me just turn this this way so I'm, I'm flush here in order to get square here it's just a matter of opening this bad boy up a little bit whoa wrong screw <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, almost 3 eighths out. So I'm gonna line up my screw off the edge. And then I'm just going to use my thumb to move this into position. Flush. Square. Piece of cake. Oh yeah, now we're getting somewhere. Once I put this in, it'll start to come together pretty quick. My daughter's actually on vacation right now while I'm building this. And no, she knows what I'm doing. She just doesn't know what I'm doing. <laughs> she knows I'm building a bench and she knows I'm putting in a privacy screen. But the details, ah, the details. I got a phone call last night. Turns out there's gonna be a wedding in the family. That's nice. So hopefully when she comes back, I have this finished. It's kind of like a wedding announcement present. Huh? Not bad. All right, last board. Let's get this one on. Why not? It's a bit of an overhang, but when it's all put together, the furniture will come up to the side, and then... That doesn't help you very much at all, does it? Ah. <laughs> the furniture will come across and then up the side here, and you won't even see any of this detail. All they'll see from the top is an extra large coffee table for setting their drinks, maybe some outdoor lights. I'll let her decorate, that's her business. Let's go screw it into place. Let's get it right on our corner. Here we go. Ah, now that we have this dimension, we have to finish cutting our boards off like we did at the very beginning. But we know exactly where we're going to finish. So we are going to measure off exactly to eight feet. And with a little bit of luck, of course it's not in the middle of a board. All right. 96, here we go. All right, let's get that done. We'll get these brackets on, and then we'll start building benches. All 
Now, I got my bench finishing at eight feet plus the three quarters. And the truth is, I could probably just run the cut a little long. But the last thing I want to see on my finish deck is a saw cut. That was too deep. So, beautiful thing about cedar soft wood. Here we go. There, that is exactly where the last bracket goes. Cheers. Now when we're going and screwing in in the same direction as the boards are running, you gotta remember that we're gonna be about six or eight inches in and the boards have a propensity to wanna, they wanna split on you. So here, my bracket's in the middle of a board, that's good. But everywhere there's a, a red square, except for this one, that one's, that one's laying up okay. That one's not terrible, but this one's not good, that one's not good. We gotta make some adjustments. So here, for instance, I'm gonna move the bracket to this location so it's in the middle of the board. And this one I'm gonna run off here as well. All right. This one, I'm gonna move just, just cheat a little bit. And I'm also gonna go to drill bit and I'm gonna pre-drill the surface so that I'm not putting so much pressure on that cedar so it doesn't split on me. All right, let's get this done. First thing is first, gonna get our brackets installed, screw it to the back side. All right, guys, I know I got a Milwaukee bed set. Um, buy metal, it's a really good set. Um, here's the screw I'm gonna use. The reason wood splits is not because of the threads, it's because of the shaft, okay? Now, this is designed structurally approved by engineers and sold as a package so that you don't have to get it checked. Checked underneath. What you do is you put the screw underneath the bit. And if you can't see the threads coming out of both sides, then the bit's too big. If you can see the shaft coming out, it's too small. You wanna just go along until you find the right size where you're drilling out just the shaft, but not the threads. And I think that's winner, winner, chicken dinner. But because of expansion contraction, I'm gonna go one shy and give it a try because if that works without splitting, I would rather have an overly tight fit right now under a little extra compression because I'm expecting the cedar to dry out and shrink just a little bit. And I don't want it to shrink to the point where it just rips off the threads and somebody goes sits on the bench. That would really suck. Now, the way to do this properly is one screw at a time. Don't go pre-drilling all your holes because we were gonna be working on an angle here. See how that whole thing shifted when I did that? Now I can do the other side. I am actually pretty happy with this. That seems to be working out really well. Now, the next one I do, I want you to pay close attention to it. Because you'll see when I get near the end, this all this compresses right into the wood. If it doesn't compress into the wood and grab really tight, that means that the wood is split underneath because you can't see. So let's try this again. Okay. Here we go. Right there, see? That means I got a perfect grab. And that's what gives me confidence. You've ever put in a screw before, and just as it gets near the end, it just starts spinning. Yeah, <laughs> that means it's not holding on to nothing. Now I gotta figure out a way to get this to 18 inches. That's my finished front, okay? So, these boards are, we're gonna call them 5 eighths just for the purpose of anything. And we're gonna use the same board across the front. And we're gonna switch to the deck boards for the bench we're gonna switch back to these for the horizontal rise. So it'll match up with this, give or take. Okay. Um, yeah, it'll be pretty darn close. What I need, if I'm gonna have boards coming this way, is I need this sort of support to continue, All right? And so I thought about the most cost-effective way to do this. And what it's gonna be is I'm gonna attach a two by four across the front of this, all right? one and a half inches from the top. So then I can also um, 
build a, uh, a little knee wall on the front and just lay some blocks across to continue on. And then we'll clad it all in the cedar. All right, so this, this is gonna seem a little painful, but it'll be all right. So the height of this is exactly 15 and a quarter. Let's do some math. 15 and a quarter minus one and a half minus three is 12 and a quarter. I'll cut a couple of those blocks and I'll lay my two by four on it and just screw them in. And then confirm that this is indeed eight feet long. Yep, close. It is within a hair. All right, these ones are also now cut, right? Put that in the cut pile. Bring this out. Always, always, always measure your lumber, even if it's supposed to be an eight foot. Because when you're doing what we're doing, there's no room for extra eighths. <laughs> it can actually be a little shorter. You can still clad something if it's short, but you can't work with it if it's long. Golden rule. Two and a half inch screw, perfect. Okay. Now it makes things simple. I'm just gonna line up. Location of where these screws are gonna go. Okay. Hmm. I did the wrong math. Yeah, that one's going up and down, not flat. So it's 15 and a quarter minus three and a half plus one and a half. That's five inches of 15 and a quarter. That makes this 10 and a quarter. Whoops. You're gonna find the longer out here in the sun, the dumber you get. <laughs> so the slower you gotta move, pay attention. Don't, don't cut a finger off. Confirm everything as you go. Be happy with everything you attach. Here we go. There we go. Okay. And miraculously, that's actually just a little bit too high. You can feel that. So, now that that first screw will hold everything in place, I'm gonna just kinda, there we go. Same thing. Just a little bit high. All right. I'll just drive a few more screws. Make sure that every one of these brackets is attached. That way, everything we do from here on in is twice as strong. Here's a great opportunity to get a square out. Now remember, we're doing all the horizontal boards. So my build out, I need horizontal bars where all these seats are, seat brackets, okay? So I wanna bring this up to the same height as this and then have a two by four come across to carry this load, transfer it into this, and that's gonna work out fine. So I'm just gonna make a series of L's to sit in place and then we'll start We'll start screwing the face boards on. That's gonna be super fast. Now, the height of this, it's easier to measure off then, 13 and three quarters. Okay, and we wanted an 18 bench. That's 10 and a quarter. That's seven and three quarters. But I want it on the finish. I'm gonna go 17 so that the cushions are over top of the finished wood. I really gotta consider that. My cushion comes to 18, so I don't want my framing to be more than 17. So then, 
my cedar facade will be just shy of 18. And it'll allow for a little variance. Okay, so we're gonna go with six and three quarters. 13 and three quarters. Okay, all out of two by fours. And I'm gonna need seven, 14 of them. So while I'm cutting this, I might as well cut the other side too. We're just going to pre-drill the screws. Mine as well. It's just too difficult working with multiple pieces when you only have two hands, right? Alright. Yeah, it's that simple. Amazing thing is, if you don't have a chop saw, you can still do all of this with a skill saw and a square. This might seem like overkill, but consider this. This is still gonna take a fair amount of abuse and having that anchored at the bottom, it's just gonna give me a little peace of mind. Okay. Once again, most important thing I have going on here right now is getting this square. Okay, so I want to come off my bracket, put that in position, drive that in. Right now. There we go. Just want to put that on there. That's beautiful. I am going to drive one screw Reverse, get my angle. There we go. I'll lock that in in a couple of locations now. We're gonna square this off, throw a screw in. It's time for lunch. So we're gonna go here. And I'm just gonna put one foot on this here. And pull this over. Ah. That is close enough for me and the girls I go out with. Whew. All right. Let's grab some linen, something to eat. Something to drink before we die. After lunch, we'll finish framing the other side. Time to collide it, baby. This is gonna look very intentional now. Ah, this is where I start to look smart. <laughs> well, not stupid, how's that? All right, so here's our plan. We're gonna wrap the front of this the same as this, right? Only we're going to put the bench on first so they finish at the same height. Not bad, eh? So then this, this cladding will stick up a little bit proud, pick up to the height of there. Very intentional. Comes to the back of this bench. Now, I got an 18 inch cushion. I'm gonna have about a quarter inch overhang. Great. It's also a, about a, a one and a half inch cushion, two inch cushion. And the back is 19, which takes it to 21. All right, so that's the height of my cushion. Now, if we come back over here, you'll see that with the quarter inch spacing, four boards takes us to 22, all right? So, what we're gonna do then is we'll go four boards across the back. That takes me to 22. The finished cushion height is 21. I'll even put a cap on it. There we go, piece of cake. Just measure backwards. Always know your cushion size and then you can do your math backwards to come up with the dimensions. And uh, definitely recommend building out the base like this. Uh, for just a couple of bucks you can get a full size piece of furniture instead of a, a cheap looking deck bench. This goes from bench to sofa, right? And it doesn't cost much because these, these brackets are actually relatively affordable compared to wood nowadays. They give you all the structural strength and the detail. So really pleased with the way this is working out. Yeah, so eight foot sofa, outdoor furniture with cushions for less than 600 bucks. That's a hell of a good deal. So just setting this up for production. 
We're gonna set it at 22. You know, this keeps moving around, it's gonna be a problem. I'm gonna throw a couple screws in it. There we go. Now, I've got a permanent stop. I've got this. Yeah. Now my hair long on purpose, because it gives me mercy. Because I'm face screwing, I can always set the corner, put in the screw, even if there's a little gap behind this wood, it doesn't matter. Right? So that is absolutely perfect. Now we will throw a few face screws on here, for good measure. Spacers. I ran out of pencils. Now the mat's happy, helping me here. So I'm just cut one in half. Seemed like a bright idea at the time. Coolest thing about this composite material is it holds a screw really well. Okay. And it goes right through two and a half inch screw to the other side of the bracket. That'll lock this in. It's not going anywhere. Actually, yes, yeah, pretty solid. My goodness. Woo, that went way too far. All right, we'll do that again. <laughs> if it goes through the, the surface, it's not holding anything, eh? There we go. We'll just slow her down a little bit. All right. All right, we've decided that the perfect angle for here is 15 degrees. That gives me somewhat of a flat top. And, uh, I am loving this. Now we're going to just line up the outside edge here. Any gaps that occur at the other end, not gonna worry about it. It's of no consequence. The goal is all about how we're gonna finish here because we're gonna wrap the cedar around the end, just like we did with the box. Truly the most difficult part of this is gonna be the finishing, adding the stain. Because we are gonna stain this. It is going to be a water-based penetrating sealer and it is gonna require a certain finesse. So you're gonna to wanna to stick around for this. By the way, the next video in the series is gonna be how we take that little tiny landing off the back deck, off the back patio door, sorry. We're gonna turn it into something substantial. So let's talk through the plan. Bottom cushions, 46 by 18. Okay, that takes me into 92 inches. All right, now if I put two huge cushions out here and I have this much space left over, I have a problem. But the back cushions are 24 by 19. So with a cushion down here, 19 is here is perfect. But 24 four times is eight feet right to here. So I came up with a plan. Basically, I'm gonna put two by four right here. And then two by fours like this, right out to the front, okay? And then I'm gonna clad it in cedar, wrap it around, put a top cap on it, make an armrest. <laughs> Not bad. That gives me 46 to the inside finished and puts somewhere to put a drink on this other end of the bench. It'll also, wrap around with that miter joint right off of here. Okay, perfect. And then I'll have this, and then we'll just do miter joint just like the, 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 the end table. We'll run that right to the bottom. And then over here, I'll put a 15 degree on it. Boom. And I'll, I'll overlap the edge of that board just off the back wrist there. And it'll help keep all these cushions in place. I think it's brilliant. The only thing I have to do is I have to remind myself to leave enough space for this cushion here. So I gotta build this armrest. Ooh, that's, that's an interesting point, Jeff. They come a little bit shy. 
okay? So when I got it all wrapped and clad and I got my armrest on here, right? I'm holding this one in place, but I have room for this one to slide down in behind it. Oh, that's gonna be a bit of science. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I still think it's gonna look amazing to do that. Let's just tear this old crap apart. Minimum code means that you put one nail at the top and two in the bottom of each of these spindles, which means step one, tear the thing apart. Ugh, I'm not as young as I used to be. <sighs> Minimum code. When an old man can tear it apart with his bare hands. Yep, that's minimum code. <laughs> All right, be careful now. Don't want to damage anything. You know, if you want to build something right, consider maybe a couple of structural screws. Wouldn't hurt, eh? Let's take all this off and see what we got to work with. We'll take as many screws out as we can. This is called working smart, removing as many screws as possible. I don't know if this is attached to the house. I think it's just the whole structure just sitting on the steel. Yeah. It's not actually attached. Oh my God, wait a minute. Oh, there's one bolt there. How the hell is that a test? There we go. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right. Probably three or four screws over here too. We've got these two steel members bolted into the foundation wall and then Everything else is just sitting on top. So, in theory, I can take my two by eights and set them on top, extend them out as far as I wanna go. So I can take three of them, a couple of rims, come across, nail them to the rims, structural fasteners. Oh yeah, baby. We're gonna make this as big as we feel like. So easy. These are bolted to the frame, but they're not gonna be incorporated into the actual rebuild. I'm gonna just get rid of these. Nice and simple. And that's it. Okay. This is the nuts and bolts of our deck here. <laughs> like it's all a little bit flexible. Um, the holes aren't in the same spot. Not sure. They must have drilled these on site. Because we're going to go 16 inch on center, give or take. It's not really all that close, but it's hard to get a drill in here to put a nut in too close to this inside corner. So I think that's why they cheated. But I'm gonna be coming back with this bad boy right here. This is a structural screw, acts as a lag bolt. And I'm gonna be using this to put in my wood. It's got a washer head. So I think that'll be a lot easier to put in the right spot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure off and drill some new holes. We have, there it is. I'm gonna find one uh, that is just a tad bigger than the hole that I need. There we go, winner, winner. Uh. Okay. Yeah, that's off. Measuring off 16 and a quarter. That puts that one. Oh, these holes are already on. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's always so dramatic at the end, eh? All right. 
Yeah, that's that much out of level. Over just this 32 inches, it is three eighths of an inch out of level. When they're building these things, it's a production build, right? They just stick it on the wall and go. It's not even level on the back, but it's not quite as bad. This is only out one eighth instead of three. Hmm. So there's a remedy for that and we're gonna fix it as we build our frame. So I'll show you that in a minute. But what we're gonna do is just work out our plan here a little bit. I'm gonna have a privacy screen coming right across surface deck, six and a half feet tall. And I'm gonna build this platform out to meet the deck, but just shy. So it acts like a step, but it, this, this will float independently of this. Okay, so this is attached to the house and this isn't. Four season weather, we can heave in the frost a bit if it needs to be, it won't be a problem. We'll leave like maybe half an inch of a gap just for everybody can be comfortable. But I don't want to have this much of a cantilever. That's really aggressive. Because we're using structural lag screws on both sides of the steel, that'll keep the deck from flipping up, okay? But I don't have an engineer here on site. So I'm thinking I'm gonna tighten this up just a little bit so that my privacy screen here will be at this location out to here. And then I'll start back here and then carry on. And I'm, what I wanna do is I wanna leave enough room here for someone to be on the deck reaching past the privacy screen to open or close the gas line, right? So that way you don't have to jump off the end of the deck and then walk all the way around. And we want to have access to that, okay? So it's not perfect privacy, but it's close enough. Like if somebody really wants to spy on you, <laughs> they're gonna find a way. So this is good. Let's take a look at this side. Just for the sake of balancing this out, I'm gonna add a couple of feet on this side as well but I want to come shy of this because I'm going to be putting a railing on that side and we don't want to interfere with that. So I'm going to go outside measurement 14 and we'll go to here. When you're building a deck, uh, something structural like this, that's cantilevered, you want to treat every one of these joists like a rim joist. You want to double it up. So times two, okay? And when you get to the end, you're going to want to do this. You want to have this one be the widest and the second one you want to have it come an inch and a half shy. Okay. And then you're going to want to use something like this that has structural screws in it to bring out one joist and then tack a second joist on the outside into this. Right. And then you have the second one here so the two of them add extra strength, but then you're nailing everything together at two different lengths as well two different ways, two different fasteners, some screws, some nails. It just really multiplies the capacity of that. So you can't just rip it apart with your bare hands like the last one we had. But I'll get into all of that in a minute. If I want my outside measurement to be 68 and I'm gonna be tacking on a second, I have to take off three. So we're gonna go a 65 inch. All right, and a 68. So I need 65 and a 62. And then in the second one, we're gonna go 62, 62. We're just gonna make it a double. And this one, I'm gonna go same, 62s. And then boom, boom. And then we'll go with another 62 and then a 65 at the other end. Four, five, six. All right, there we go. So now I got my frame. I'm gonna go wide, short, 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 wide, and then I'll have this going on, okay? So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna double up. I'm gonna double check my, my overhang here. Remember dimensional lumber, doesn't matter how wide the board is. Anything that's two is the same thickness, so there we go. That's relatively flush there. And I'm loving that. Okay, this is my long one. This is the short one. I've lined them up, I got my gaps right. I'm gonna laminate them together now from the backside. So when I roll it up in a position, I don't risk putting a bunch of nails into the siding. All right. And I wanna keep it away.
So let me just do this real quick. So I'm going to measure off to screw this from underneath right now. We're going three inches past. This point here is only one and a half inch past because I'm going to be adding a board on the outside. So I'm going to go one and a half. My center line looks to be about eight and three quarters. Okay, so it's eight and three quarters from here to where this center of this is. Let's just put that on. There, that's where my bolt goes. Now this is a bit of a teeter-totter mess. Okay, so two things I'm doing here. One, I'm putting this all the way towards the siding, and then I'm gonna pull it off the siding, a good quarter or so, okay? And I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna go like that. Mark my location here, four and three eighths, four and a quarter. Okay, there we go. Now I got my starting point. I'm square to the house for whatever that's worth. <laughs> There's my location. I bring that black line over to the middle of that rail on my line. There we go. And I'll do the same to the other one. All right, sweet. Now, this is temporary. Um, we also have a leveling issue. And I don't know, because it teeters, Matt, if I can do the leveling now or if I gotta do it later. So I'm just marking three quarters off the center of that hole um, because wood is one and a half inches wide and I want it center of that hole on this beam here, right? So by putting that there, and then, Hopefully, seven and a quarter. Come over here, put my seven and a quarter mark. We'll line those two up and put a bolt in there. Ah, now this is somewhat temporary because I am planning on coming back on this all later on and then squaring off this box. But you can see I can't build anything in as it's tipping over. So, <laughs> gotta keep her from tipping over. There we go. Now we're going to assume that this is square to the house, which it isn't, and that's fine. But this has the ability to move, right? So I can pretty much <laughs> square that off as I go. <laughs> Bizarre. What was that again? Seven and a quarter, right? Yeah. Okay, and then... Um, that is three quarters there, isn't it? Yeah, so we'll just bring it to the edge of that metal. Good. Foundation of our structure. How exciting. Ah. All right. Okay. Let's see how he measures. Yes. It seems like we got ourselves a warp. So what we're gonna do is get rid of a warp here. This would be interesting enough, eh? Okay. The process for this. Oh, the nails are pretty close to here, but we're gonna just wedge in my hammer, <clears throat> create a gap, and then I'm gonna drive this screw I don't think that's really long enough to make that work. I'm gonna have to get closer to the front. There we go. Okay. So now I've got the screw in on an angle. Now I can get rid of the hammer. Okay. And drive that in and it should pull it down. Ish. Yeah. When you got a warp on a short piece of wood, it's kind of hard to deal with it. You sink that head far enough. I'm just gonna grab the planer and fix that. 
So I need to get end box now. 48. Exactly 48. Well, I'll be. That's handy because I've got eight foot lumber. Forty-eight and forty-five. So here's my forty-five. Let's see what we got going on here. find out if we're at all square here. I could measure three, four, five, but it's small and I got a square sitting right here. Wow, look at that. Lo and behold, that's, that's freaking me out. <laughs> all right. Not too often when you visualize it and it, it's still square. I'm uh, going to put a brace on this before I build anything else. Okay. Without putting a hole in my hand, this is just temporary. Okay, that'll hold it square while we build. Awesome. I did it off camera, so it's not very much fair to you guys, but I showed you how it wasn't level on the back, right? And it wasn't level on the front, but I didn't show you how to level it. So I did this earlier, I already know. This one, we're gonna assume is level coming off the building. We're not gonna increase the difficulty. I've used the stairs before. I never felt like I was falling forward, so we're just gonna say, okay, that slope is good. But that is three eighths. Bam. The one in the back was out one eighth. Bam. I put this in the middle of these two. So according to the laws of slope, it's two eighths. Bam. The secret here is to install that under the beam where there's a hole when I put the screw in. It's easier if I can actually see the hole. I'm not going to go tight. Okay, so that he can lift it again. Here we go. Let's get that one in. All right. What we're doing here is we're adding structural steel and screw element to the beam. This is an inside cap and it'll go into this so that this beam is not going to be just nailed to it. It'll also be screwed to it. I just like the idea of having everything nailed and screwed. That's feeling really good to me there. I'm gonna get on the ground, slide up into position, and use that to stay out of the muck. Ugh, people wanna know how I stay clean all the time. I work like a princess. All right. Should I give you a hand or? What, did you get out of here? Please, I got in, I can sure as hell. What's that gasoline? Whoa! All right. Still got it. <laughs> All right. Wow. Okay. We're gonna use uh, joist tape today. Why not? We're gonna have a, a lovely ensemble of your ass in the camera. That's level. <laughs> you know, I got enough to actually do this. This is pretty cool. So I don't have to worry about doing any of that cut and seal. Ah, if you joist tape, you don't need cut and seal. Yay. I mean, you can probably get benefit of using cut and seal regardless. I was planning on using joist tape out here from the beginning because I had it. 
which is why I didn't use the cut and seal like I did in the rest of the deck. Whew. All right, so here we are. I'm gonna picture frame this so it's nice, so it's pretty, just like the deck. It's kind of a semi picture frame. I'm just gonna do one across the front and then we're gonna go this way with all our boards, just like the deck. And in a perfect world, I would have measured off and built this to be the exact same size so that my deck boards lined up with these deck boards, but it's not a perfect world and it won't really matter. So we're gonna go with uh, 71 and three quarters. Woo, that's some decent shape still. I'm gonna do some surface screwing. So I've got my overhang at one and three quarters. Boom. All the sides. Because, you guessed it, we are going to take cedar and we're going to cap all this and make it look pretty later. So we want it to be consistent. The secret here for the strength is because these screws don't really have heads, is if I step here, the board wants to roll. I'm gonna add a little more support there later, but for now, I'm gonna go just off the side. There you go, now it won't roll. We're just gonna go a little overkill. Why not? One more here. All right, and a couple of surface screws here as well. Okay. All right. Okay. Right, here we go. There we go, guys. Look at that. Now it's coming together. Well, there we have it, gentlemen. Okay. You know, funny thing is, these uh, hidden fasteners, they've been in the industry a long time. And still a lot of people don't know about them. Generally speaking, they take about twice as long to install on a deck as a regular fastener. And for that reason alone, a lot of the guys in the trades shy away from the uh, use of them, which is a big mistake. Because it more than doubles the life expectancy of the deck. So as a consumer, Make sure you ask about it. I asked for the camo system by name specifically because there is another hidden deck system out there where they actually screw a metal bracket to the top of the surface of the deck and then it extends and goes like in a, on a, like a V-shape back down to the deck. But you have to crawl under the deck to attach all the screws from underneath. Back in the day, that was the only thing available. So if somebody wanted a hidden deck fastener, well, that was, they were really paying for something special at that point. It's like not too many people ready to, ready to crawl along underneath the deck to, just to be able to screw it down. If I'm going to be putting down tools, having two of these makes things go a lot faster. And now I've got to go rip something. Two and three eighths. Two and a quarter. All right, we need a cutting surface. We're gonna use this side, measure over. So, I'll screw this down. All we do now is I lift the plate a little bit, so now I'm guaranteed to cut all the way through. 
but not cut the actual deck. When you're cutting the black line is where the blade goes. So it's always best to have it on your pencil mark so you don't cut too small. Here we go. And now we shape. We want to give it the same bevel as the other side of the wood. Like a glove. Okay, well, this is a little trick here now. All right, the last part of the project today is to finish installing a little handrail here. And as you know, we're going with black accent. So we've got some caps over there, done with the post bases. Um, there's another option. You could have always done the four x four post as a part of the structure. But generally speaking, um, a safety railing like this, just for a couple feet off the ground, it's not really necessary to integrate it. And it's a little more flexibility for location. This allows me to um, screw the bottom of the base right down, right to the cat to the to the bottom here, uh, and I can pick my location to be right on the joist on three locations at least anyway, which is good. What we need to know is in order to install this bad boy, we got to design a handrail. Now. That's 34, the caps go in there three quarters of an inch. So that makes it 32 and a half of actual space. I'm gonna put a two by four like this, top and bottom. So that's 32 and a half, a seven is 39 and a half. I'm gonna have a two by four across the top on the flat. Makes it 41, and I'm gonna have one inch in space on the bottom. That makes it 42, and because I'm using these, I need 43, and I like to have an inch between the cap and the handrail, so make, we'll cut the post 44. Boom, done. Ah, so I'm gonna just cut a couple 44s. We need three pieces of lumber. Uh, let's go not too close to the house. I'm gonna be able to put a cap on that later. That will clear just fine. Three pieces of lumber. And we'll go forward a little bit here. I think that makes it 37. Yeah, 37 inches. That sounds like fun. <laughs> okay, so let me just get all this cut. Two at 44, three at 37. Piece of cake. Here we go. So now we got that straight. We need a measuring tape here, my pencil. Now you want to have a spindle every four inches. So you can take a quick look from the end and go, okay, well, let's assume we start at four. Mm -hmm. um, four times, that one is still a four. Now that's a five inch hole. Problem with that is this is attached to the house. It's higher than two feet off the ground. It has to meet code for the handrail can't have that big of a hole. Or some little young kid with the pointy head is gonna stick his head through that hole, get stuck, fall off the side, break his neck, and I get sued. So what we're gonna do, <laughs> that's why I went to 37, because it's more educational. We're gonna go 36 is 18 and half is my center. So here's my center line, all right? We're gonna drill there. And we're gonna take a look at what every four inches looks like here. 16 is my last one. And then it'll be the same gap on the other side. Okay? That works really nice. So there's my spot right there, I believe, right? Sixteen. So four, eight, twelve.
The reason you want to use the square to mark this off is I've already made these ends the same size and they're flush. And by using the square, I'm going to drill in the same location. That'll keep all my spindles straight up and down. When I'm all done, I'll take out my sander, get rid of my pencil lines, clean up all my edges, get rid of all of my stray hairs, we call it. Well, I don't know if it's a we, but it's definitely a me. I call it the hair. Cedar has a tendency to do that, especially when the saw blade's been working a while. It starts to get a little fray. Okay, here we go. Now, we also have one and a half inch lumber. We want to have everything in the center. That's at three quarters. That's this line right here. There, that's easier to do. Okay, that'll be a lot easier to see. So, we're just gonna start down here. And, well, hell with it. I'm cutting it on anyway. Let's just go like this. Okay. I know exactly where the Forstner bit goes. Now, if you're not familiar with the Forstner bit, that's what these are. They're basically flat bottom holes. Almost. Now that's a Ryobi kit. It has a bunch of sizes and it has a pointy tip. So it's not a true Forstner, but for anybody at home, that kit was only 30 bucks. And they don't have the exact size for these spindles that you buy off the shelf at Home Depot. Because those spindles come with a little rubbery type kind of plastic cap. So the challenge here is this. You have the option to buy the pressure treated rails at the Home Depot pre-drilled. They're not always in stock and more and more nowadays you got to learn how to do everything yourself from scratch. So that's why we're doing this. Um, they don't make them in the cedar. They used to years ago when you know supply wasn't an issue. But now it's like why would I cut boards and stick it there and maybe no one will buy it. So now I'm going to drill all this. Now I need to do something so I can mark the end of my flat part of the bit. Three quarters. And for good measure, I'm going to cut to one inch deep. Just because things move over time. And when you're installing, you want to have a little flexibility. Okay? It's okay if the hole's a little bit bigger. Um, if I go a quarter deeper, it means it's only in the top of half an inch. But that's plenty to make it function. It just makes it easier to install. And now I stick the tip of that little bit right there on the, on the line in the middle of my black hole. And drill. Until my black line is at the edge. Now you could use painter's tape or any other kind of tape? I have no tape on me today. So that's why I'm going gangster and using marker on the bit. Yeah, I know. Um, just a quick tip. If you're doing a series of rails around the house and they're all different measurements, um, do yourself a favor. Always measure from the center unless you get the rail right up at the edge if you measure that. Then you can go left to right, or right to left, whatever. But almost always starting in the center is going to give you the most uh, professional look. To have the same gap each end of each rail section, which by code have to be only five feet or smaller. It's real obvious to anybody who walks in the room if you took the time to use a measuring tape. Okay, I just gotta sand. I got my post. Uh, this one here has got a couple of little splits in it, but that's okay. I got a two by four and two by four and cap and two by four, and I'm gonna have it facing in towards the rest of the stuff. So that's good. And it'll get attached to this. Wow, that was easy. And then we use these screws here. Now, this gets, believe this or not, 
going to show you. Four in the bottom, okay, and then four around the edge. And then when it's time to screw it down to the deck, we screw it through the outside corners, okay? So first you attach it to the your member here. And I'm going to do it this way because I like to remind myself which way it's facing. Now because this is softwood lumber, there's no need to pre-drill. All right? Just uh just set it up and go. One word of advice, get a brand new Phillips number two bit. <laughs> if it starts to strip like this, you're in trouble because this is soft metal. It's uh, hardware from China. Like I've always said, they make the worst screws on the planet. They got the softest steel. So you gotta be real careful. It's not a dis. It's just a fact. If anybody is offended with the fact that Chinese still sucks, I'm not gonna apologize. They knew it when they made it. They made it to be cost effective, not strong. Oh, neighbor's cooking again. Ay, yeah, yeah. I wonder if they wanna adopt another son. Is that my split? Yep, there we go. One down, one to go. The screws that they're using to mount to the deck are actually, um, they require a half inch drive. You might wanna go out and get yourself a little set, these little sockets. Uh, most structural components out there require some sort of a six sided head. So I, I bought a set, has a half, it has a um, seven sixteenths, it has three quarter. I think that's it, just all the majors, okay? We'll get to that in a minute. And I know you said, you know, you don't have to pre-drill. Every once in a while, you come across a piece of this that's a knot. And if you get a knot, you can either pre-drill or just leave it alone. We're talking about eight screws to secure the base. If one of them can't go in for whatever reason, it's not gonna be the end of the world. Yeah, it's something like that. Oh well. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. This nasty split is courtesy of Home Depot. Huh? Climate controlled storage means that stuff really dries out. We're gonna go back here. I do not need to do any more work here. So I am gonna switch over. I'm gonna anchor this post and I'm gonna put my first rail in and then we'll go from there. Now, in this environment, it wouldn't hurt to pre-drill. Again, the cedar boards here. We want something that's the same size as the shaft. Boom. Okay, and we have one and three quarters. I always check, I don't know why. I know what it is. There we go. That's as far out as I can go. As long as this gap is less than four inches, you're fine. I'm gonna try to make it somewhat square here. Okay, it's all in the details. If you build everything square, then everything lines up. For instance, we have a two by four here. It's gonna go across the top. Well, what happens if this is installed with a bit of a twist? And that one isn't at that end. So it's nice and closed and square there. And over here, you got an open gap. Well, that, that's the kind of workmanship where you're really gonna get in trouble. So also have to consider the fact that the wood in most cases is going to be um, <laughs> twisted in a lot of cases. So here's a secret. Are you serious? What am I doing here? Oh, my wrong hole. Trying to put that in as if the pre-drill, but well, that was actually a screw. <laughs> okay. I'm only gonna put one screw in one corner right now. All right, I'm gonna set this one up, same thing. One of the outside corners. Allows these to all rotate in place. Then I'm gonna build all of this and then I'm gonna set the rest of the screws, okay? 
Just a little bit of voodoo goes a long way here, guys. Setting up one and three quarters again off the edge, two inches off the front, pre-drill. And we're gonna put this on a bit of an angle. I want my screw angled this way and that way. So I'm gonna hold it from out here. Now, let's build. We're gonna build on these blocks. These are one inch. Perfect spacer, set it and forget it. Boom. Forgot to count for the height of these bad boys. I only gave myself one inch clearance. And then I gave myself another inch, another two inches just in case. I'm an idiot. And I am two inches to the cap and that's only one and a half, so I have half inch to spare. Whew, dodged a bullet there. That was not in purpose. That was just me knowing that I do dumb stuff. So I gave myself an extra two inches on the post because I'd rather have higher posts for no particular reason and then cut them down if I find them looking stupid than to cut a $45 piece of cedar yeah. in two pieces and be a half an inch short, that would be really maddening. These things come with special brackets. You know, and you can use them. But again, these black screws, they strip super easy. Now the Robertson this time around instead of Phillips, which is a miracle. But basically all it is, is you stick these to the end of the, and then you stick them in, and you gotta take into account the measurement here. So it gets a little bit bloody ridiculous, doesn't it? Um, I'm not gonna use them. I'm just gonna go old fashioned. I find it's just too many, too many pieces of black. And I'm going to get cedar deck screws. Alrighty. Rules for decking. When you're doing a, a railing like this, you gotta do two things. You gotta attach it and you gotta keep it from moving over time, okay? Really hard to screw in an angle. Start up top, put it in a hole, put it in reverse. And then while it's spinning backwards, change your angle. Now you've burned the entry angle. Look at that, ready to roll. Perfect every time. Perfect every time. Now this looks like it might be a bit of a pain in the butt, right? My son Nate taught me this trick. I had him doing all the spindles on a job one day. Oh, it may not work with this. <sighs> yeah, it won't work with this. Sorry, Nate, your trick will not work because I'm not using the rubber stops. Let's just try to line it all up and see if we can get lucky. Ho, ho, ho. What he does is he twists and lifts it up a little bit into the hole. Here we go, here we go. Almost got them all. Oh, shoot. <sighs> yes. Okay. Now the only thing left to do is make sure that it's level because the holes can be inconsistent. I'm just gonna measure this off. One end I am 32 and a half. The other end I am 32 and three quarters. We're gonna see if we can drop this down a bit. Here, that'll be the same. Nice, 32 and a half, 32 and a half. Beautiful. All right. Okay, so we're gonna make sure that we are perfectly somewhat squarish. We'll do the same thing to these ends here. Okay, so I like where everything is laying. Uh, my gaps are healthy.
Nice. Well, that's got to be just as good, if not better, than the last one. At least it's not ugly. We got the little tiny set screws here. Wow, that just made it, eh? Whew, if you're not handsome, be lucky. That looks a little sloppy with that big fat head on it. Maybe we'll have to switch it out to something not so obnoxious. But anyway, it's five bucks. Listen, if you don't cap your posts, what happens is, is the water sits there and then it starts to eat through the grain that's exposed. And then it just goes nothing but splits, okay? So do yourself a favor. Always cap your posts like everyone else in the neighborhood. Oh yeah, they didn't. Wow, enjoy putting that new fence up in 10 years. Ay yeah, yeah. Basically what I'm using here is a couple of over five quarter boards. Remember, whenever you order a large amount of wood for a project like this, you're gonna have a few that just really aren't desirable. And that's fine. Usually they have a warp or a bend. Now it's time to cut them in half, okay? So we can use that wood as our support under the nosing. And then we can add lattice underneath after that, all right? I'll show you as I build, but let's just walk through this. I have to adjust my blade height. Whenever you're ripping long pieces of wood, it's hard to work with a table saw, especially with wet lumber. The blade just gets killed instantly. These little thin blades from Diablo work really well on wet wood. So I recommend using a skill saw. I'm gonna just take that adjust my plate just a little bit higher off the wood. So I'm gonna cut clean through, all right? And I am actually cutting into a piece of pressure treated lumber. So it's gonna act like my table today and I'm just gonna rip, rip, rip and I throw one screw at the other end. I'm good to go. So here we are, time to rip. So the board is five and a quarter. And so we're looking at cutting at around the two and three quarter mark, all right? Now in this situation, one piece goes at the top and the other piece actually goes at the very bottom of the skirting to protect the lattice from damage. So I'm not too concerned about being right on the money. It's more about being consistent. So there's two and a half, there's two and three quarters. What I'm gonna do is use my finger on my plate up against the cedar as my guide. And helps if I plug it in. <laughs> there we go, that's more like it. Now I'm gonna pull this forward just to get started. Here we go. Now, we've got top and bottom. What we're gonna do is take the first board, put it the cut side up, right up underneath the nosing. Now it's next to impossible to do this on your own. All right, so what I'm gonna suggest, get an extra pair of hands going. I'm gonna throw an extra screw right there. Set the wood on it. Okay, now I'll come to the other end. And this, uh, I'm gonna start off right flush here. There we go. Okay, we'll just put a screw every two feet, it'll be fine. Oh, it's the wrong kind of screw. Of course, whenever you're working outside, make sure you're using ACQ screws. It means it's rated for contact with cedar and pressure treated lumber. Indoor screws will rust. Now we want to measure for our lattice. And we don't want to go all the way to the ground. Now, uh, if you are in a three season climate, you don't really get a winter, then you can feel free to measure right to the ground. You'll be fine if you don't get frost. But in a four season climate, we have almost two inches of gap here. We have that for a reason. We're gonna maintain it. And then when we're all said and done, that two inch gap is gonna protect us from the ground freezing and potentially lifting the skirt before anything else does. Mostly because in that corner, the sun will come into that back corner and it'll melt the snow and then it'll freeze again. And we can get a freeze thaw cycle, even if it's minus, well, five, which is 20 degrees in the States, okay? <laughs> so that freeze thaw cycle can wreak havoc with my deck. So that's why I gotta make sure I maintain a gap. Here we go. So I got almost 18, so I'll go 16. And then at four feet, I'm gonna measure off 16, 17 with that kind of slope. 
at eight feet long. Of course, it's here. That's where the board is. 16, 17, 18. That's very consistent. All right. So now we're going to go cut the lattice, which is not very easy. I'm going to show you some secrets. So here's my system. I always have a couple extra two by fours laying around. Okay. What I want to do is make that square. We're going to call that the top of the lattice. I'm going to measure down so that my 16 is in the middle of this board. At the other end, my 18 is going to be in the middle of the board. Okay? That's how easy this is. All right. So, now what I'm looking for, if we're really careful, we take a look at the staple placement. So the middle of my board is right here, and that's 16. Let's measure that off and put a mark. Not very visible, but it's close to these staples. And if I was to measure 17, then around the halfway mark, you're gonna see that at some point I'm gonna be cutting through a staple. <laughs> and this is where it gets tricky. Cutting through the staples is brutal. So what I wanna do is remember that since I'm using that, that bottom two inches of wood, I'm gonna throw a chalk line on, but when I'm cutting, I'm gonna be careful that every time I get close to a staple, I'm gonna adjust up or down a half an inch and finish my cut away from the staples. One, it's hard on the blade, but two, that damage usually ends up resulting in tears in the wood, okay? So we're gonna take a really simple here. I'm gonna get my chalk line and throw my measurement on and then we'll get started. Okay. Yep, you can do this alone. Here we go. Get the string tight, lay it on the line, lift and snap. Now I can identify where I'm cutting and where I'm gonna have a problem. So, in advance of cutting, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna cut straight here to about this point, okay? So I'll be short, and then I'm gonna go a little bit long here, and then I'll pick up the chalk around here. All right, good to have a plan. Know the end from the beginning. And then something like this is quite easy. We put the blade on our wood, and we try to get this down where it makes a little bit of sense. Here we go. I'm gonna walk along here like on my knees basically, and reach over and do the cutting. But like I said, I'm gonna avoid the staples, finish through, jump cut, let's get this done. Not bad, I do say so myself. All right, whew, let's go install it. Now, this is a much more manageable piece. So I am going to start off at the end. You realize I still have like three inches of meat available here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find a location that I can run a screw that isn't anywhere near a staple. All right. And now I'm just gonna lift it up. This is really delicate material, all right. Um, other options you can use instead of camo screws here. Honestly, um, Galvanized crown staples. Basically the same product that they use to put this together. Okay, you can use the same thing. You can use a crown stapler. I don't mind using these screws just because they kind of pre-drill. But if you're gonna use any other kind of wood screw to put this in, you're gonna to wanna to pre-drill the hole. It's just so skinny, it splits so easy. Here we go. All right, one for down here somewhere. Here's a good spot. So now I'll do the same thing with that lattice from the other side, okay? We'll cut from a straight line again and then measure down to our three locations. Now here's the secret sauce, right? We put the other half of that down. And it's not designed to close the gap completely. It's designed to get close, okay? So here, same thing. This one's a lot closer to the actual location, so I'm gonna let that be my third, my extra pair of hands. And I'm gonna start over here and lift it off the ground. Ah. Now, I intentionally left a little more gap here just because I know the nature of the freeze thaw and the way the sun works. There we go, okay? It won't be an issue at this end of the house. So 
So we can lift it up a little bit more. That's it, guys. That adds an incredible amount of durability to this. All right. And then what we do is we finish off with some decorative stone. You're not gonna see that in this video, but when the project's completely done, we're gonna add another step in another video. We're gonna do the decorative stone. We'll get there. Make sure you subscribe. Okay, one more little step to finish this off. We wanna add the same level of protection at, at, on all four sides. So I've gotta put in a top and bottom piece there. I wanna do one where the joint is. they will never line up. So by adding that, that width, it gives that illusion that everything's fine. One more at the other end. And then all that's left for me to do is to add the um, skirt underneath the landing. Same thing, here we go. Let's set the depth of the blade. And then a little bit more. Mark off our two and a half here. Let's get our measurements. 12 and 7 eighths. Never gonna remember that much detail at my age. <laughs> Rule number one, when you're measuring materials, always write it down. Always. Oh. Phone's always gonna ring just as you're about to cut. And then you're gonna forget what you're doing. And to make things fast, measure from both ends and get two different pieces at the same time. And then the one in the middle, 16 and three quarters. That can be used for another piece of skirt another time. All right. Forty-nine, two forty-nine, eh? Okay. I need at least sixteen. Two of those and forty-nine. There it is. We got that set up. Actually, you know what? We're only going 48 on that deck because that's how wide the lattice is. <laughs> I'm going to take an inch off of this. Okay. So the landing in total is 49 to the point. We're going to go 48. We'll stop a little bit shy and that'll be fine. Um, my plan here, and that's just being smart with materials, right? My sheets are four by eight, so I can cut the height of that and I can get both sides of this landing with half a sheet if I'm smart, depending on how tall this is. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go like 18, 19 here, 19 and 21. The approach here, I know this one goes right to the ground, is to add extra stability. It doesn't get any direct sun, so I don't have a freeze thaw issue the same in the wintertime. I've also got it set up so that it's floating in the middle. It's attached on the left side and it's sitting on the ground here. So it's no different than the platform with the stairs that were here before that were on the ground. In the winter, if this freezes and I get a bit of frost lift, that's fine. Everything here can move in and settle again in the spring. So I'm gonna go a little closer to the ground just to get the right look this time. Now with all that talking, I forgot my number. Uh, 19, 21, I think, yep. Good, by four feet, nice and easy. First step is to cut this at four feet. 19 and 21, here we go. 19, 21. I've already checked the other side of the landing is not as uh, 
not as far to the ground. So whatever my left over here is, 19 and 21, but I'm at four feet. Here's my 48. Okay, we'll go 19 from here. this board this time compress it all in there largely because I've only got two locations to screw into that gives me a little room remember we're doing the gas work so we're splitting this one goes to the barbecue one's going to the fire pit we still have to do a little bit of work underneath here to connect the pipe and that's fine I got my pipes and my fittings and my string here just waiting for my gas guy to get back from vacation it should be later this week so then we'll be able to formulate an actual plan which would be nice um, but for now, at least this is all done. So I'll close this little corner up later. Uh, now it's time to clean the deck off of all the materials, get the barbecue to the other side of the property. Yes, because otherwise it'll be trapped because we're going to build a fence. Time to jump into the privacy fence. So real quick story before we get into this product and why I bought it. Um, you know, usually I go to Home Depot. That's my store. But when it comes to these boutique items, right, like systems, <sighs> Lowe's and Home Depot, they've got different brands, different competitors, different options. So I went to Home Depot and I saw the display, black aluminum with wood. I'm like, yay! Inventory was brutal. I had to call around the city to find out who had the right posts. I went and got all the kit. I was exhausted. I just dropped it off. The other day I opened one of them up and I was like really disappointed because it's a square post. So that means every piece of wood I put on there, I'd have to screw a bracket into the wood and then into the post. I'm like, that's a hell of a lot of work. I know somebody's done something better than that. So. Went to Lowe's. No, I'm not sponsored. But look at this. Here's a close-up of the aluminum, and it has a U-channel, okay? And the wood slides in, and it comes with these clips that have teeth, and it digs into the wood, and then the next piece of wood digs into that piece of wood. It creates the spacer. Perfect every time. It's idiot-proof. And I need that kind of help, right? So they have posts for the ends, for the outside corners, inside corners. Um, if you're just going to continue the fence along, double U-channel. So I was like, hallelujah, yes. Turns out this is the deal. When we first started this video series, we said we got to quote 5,600 for the fence. And I said, nah, we'll do a deck. We'll throw a privacy screen on it. I mean, look around. This is all cedar, right? I spent 5,600 bucks to get this far. So having said that, yeah, I'm a little over budget. <laughs> but that's not in the end of the world. My lattice was 200 bucks. This privacy fence is going to be 800 for the metal post because I've got one section there and I got three sections down here. That's a lot of posts. And then 800 for the wood, which I bought. A bunch of one by one by ten cedar five quarter board which means it's designed to fit in this space because this fence is designed for the five quarter board or like treks if you want to do something like that if you've got a beautiful backyard with treks and you want to bring it up for a privacy wall you can do that with this product all right ah, it has all the hardware the base covers the plates the screws everything so yay much better option um, about the same price as those other metal posts anyway so I think I only I only spent another 150 bucks, Matt, more than Home Depot. So the hell with it. We're going with this. So cheers for someone carrying a solution in stock even. Like when do you get a solution to a problem in stock nowadays? That just doesn't happen. Let me start with, uh, this is two ends, okay? Here, we'll just open this up. And I have the other box there. Here's the product. Uh, all right this is the the u channel that goes in the middle okay so you have to right, get the right box and they have different heights great great i mean like as far as an in stock solution god gotta love it now right out of the gate and i have not used this kind of a system yet i'm excited ah it marks the bottom, which is good because it probably has machine screws with a plate that gets attached, right? Um, this is not packaging. This is not just for shipping, okay? Leave this on until after you're done installing, until after you're done staining. 
huh? Especially if you're gonna do it like we do. This can actually be a protective coating, okay? So that you can, you can, well, I'm gonna actually take a knife and slice it up a little bit. But I wanna be able to set everything up and then just spray it. I got a stain that it's a water base. I'm gonna put a pump bucket, I'm gonna spray it. So I'm gonna clean all this up here real quick so that I can just do my thing. This is the dullest knife in history. So this is the one that I got off you, you cleaned up the thing on the ground, right? Okay, that's what I'm looking at. I'm gonna get a new plate. <laughs> this isn't gonna work. We're just gonna trim it back so that when we, we're done, we can actually spray this and then take the plastic off afterwards, okay? Piece of cake. We're gonna get set up. We're gonna set up our posts, get our hardware installed, line everything up. Beautiful. I need one of those over there. I need one of these over here. Top and bottom. Which what? I don't know now. Why isn't this one marked top and bottom? Oh, there it is. Machine screws. Maybe it's universal. Yep, this one's universal. No, it's not. That's not machine threaded. There we go. <laughs> Make sure you check. These holes are machine drilled. Okay, so that the plate can be attached. This location, this location. Got it? And then afterwards you can screw through the front. So make sure we line up the tops and bottoms. We'll cut back the extra plastic. We'll get our decorative caps and our hardware out. Get this job site organized. That's the next one for the middle. Maybe this blade will be better. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so that post is ready. Nice. Goes down there. Ah. Now, the only other things you need for this job, take two minutes, read the instructions, grab a chop saw on a stand. To everybody out there who's in the DIY space, who's using a chop saw in the grass, just a word of warning, guys. Um, it's actually incredibly dangerous. It's so easy to lose your balance or if somebody bumps you from behind. If you put it up on a stand, then it'll save your back and it'll make it a lot safer. You won't accidentally get thrust into the blade while it's moving. I know I'm not much for safety, but sometimes, once you've seen an accident, it will change your mind about how you're doing things. and it's aluminum anyway. So even if I scratch the aluminum, it doesn't rust. Okay, important, blah, blah, blah. Okay, don't return product to the store. You gotta love it when a company says that. Um, maximum six feet, and then the top one goes in and screws to the board. This will help keep the fence steady and simple. That's what that is, good. All right, now we understand how to use this stuff. That wasn't that tricky. One, two, three, four, five, six, there it is. Now let's see if we can get these on. And the time in the manner here. Okay. All right, ready? I don't even know if this is the right size for this. Yeah. Just a word of warning whenever you're working with things that are machined like this, do them as much as you can with your fingers, all four of them, before you pull out these kind of drivers. If anything is mildly off in the manufacturing process, once you get the first screw in a plate nice and tight, everything else is going to be shifted and adjusted. You'll never be able to get the other one lined up. Now we got it going. We're going to tighten it up real good. Alrighty then. Okay. Now placement of these posts is very important. Remember I um, have overhang. I have a one inch here of just regular wood. So, and I have a two inch overhang here. So we want to try to make this intentional. One and three quarters. One and three quarters. Good, happy with that. I'm gonna use these pieces of hardware here. Now, these are not normal screws. Um, I had leftovers. I'm gonna actually show you the package when Matt gets back. He went shopping to get more for me. <laughs> of, of all the hardware that came in that package, they didn't have mounting screws. But these are perfect. It's actually part of the structural screw system for the overhead decorative uh, metal brackets, the black powder coated black brackets. So I know that they're going to be more than enough for this. Again, the secret is going to be to pre-drill. So I'm going to set up for pre-drilling and then we can get this mounted. All right. 
Now, because we're drilling into structural lumber, I'm not going to pre-drill three inches. Just want to pre-drill, get past the cedar surface so that nothing splits on me. So I'm looking at about an inch. I have no idea exactly how square this is going to be. So. That is what we're going to do. We're going to put in two for now, and then I'll put in the next post, and then we'll start installing the wood. We'll get everything detailed later and add the last two screws later. Okay. And I'm not even drilling this all the way in. Just enough that I can get this thing built. <laughs> all right, now, that's good for all my hardware. I have 10 foot boards. I'm going to go with five foot sections. And then this is more of a four, and the last section there is going to be a little over five, so that's fine. I'm going to show you how I'm going to set up my saw right now, because I'm going to cut all my wood in advance. And then just, this is just assembly work. So the secret here is to have a saw stand and set up what's called a saw stop. Okay, that's the limitation to the material. So now I can measure, that's my five foot mark. Let's see if this wood is just a little longer. Yes, it's five and a quarter. Good. This saw can slide on my on my table here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slide my table until it's the perfect spot that I want looking for, and then I'm going to lock it in. Okay. Now every time I put wood on this side, it's going to finish at five feet. And, and that's a little sloppy. I'm going to lift this up just a little bit more. There, that's better. It figures it would have a difference, see? Eh? Alright. Here we go. Now, that's one foot for the first section. That's awesome. These are six and a half foot posts. Let's go with a half inch gap, makes that actual six. 12 is 6 feet. We'll cut 12 boards in half and then we'll start from there. That's a dumb spot for it. Let's see if everything is working out okay. So, we are going to add these stops. <laughs> Boom! We just set a spacer for how high our wood goes. Loving that. Uh, we'll do the same with this. Done. And now we're going to use the first piece of wood in order to establish where this post goes. <sighs> I wasn't going to do it, but I'm thinking. I'm not liking the furry ends. I'm going to see it through the gaps. So, quality first. Better get out the palm sander and clean these ends up. Right, so here I am thinking, oh, last day, we'll just get her done. But I don't know, I've probably spent at least an hour and a half or two hours sanding all the edges of my cut so far. I'm not going to stop now. Okay, now we can do it. There we go. So now really the only question left is, how much mercy do I want, right? Because there's no mercy there right now. But I throw in a quarter, and these gaps are actually pretty consistently, there's gotta be three, well they're five eighths gap. So that's pretty heavy. So I'm gonna throw in a quarter inch gap mercy for aesthetics. One and three quarters off the back. We'll keep that consistent. Three quarter gap to there. Checking all your line of sights because you have curved wood and weird stuff going on. That looks relatively square. I'm gonna throw two screws here. Pilot hole. Just get that first inch. We'll drive the other two. And that'll be enough to keep this in place until Matt gets back. 
Meantime, I'm going to finish building the rest of this and show you how it's done. Okay. Wow. I'm loving it. So here are the spacers. Perfect. The trick is they slide in. Everything is going to slide in these grooves. Okay. Look at that. It actually, it's going to hide the ends. So I won't see any of my ends. <gasps> Ooh, maybe I can cheat. Now you'll notice there's a little bit of room left to right here. Most of the wind that I get comes from this side. So I'm going to intentionally try to push my wood back when I set my spacers. And there's got to be an easier way. I think I'm going to get a hammer and a wooden block. And when I put the next piece in, I'll drop, give it a little love tap. All right, so I don't need a, I don't need to worry about that. So we'll go gentle for now. Make sure that I'm splitting up that gap. Push it to the back of the rail. Set it in. <laughs> Everything in life was this easy, eh? There we go. I know I paid a little bit for the materials, but honestly, this install, oh, making up for it. Okay, last thing I want to check is how wide it is at the top versus the bottom. I don't want to start getting too comfortable. My gap is 58 and an eight. Oh, it's actually tighter at the top right now. Good. I want to apologize right now for everybody who's watching this video, who's expecting to see all kinds of great carpentry tricks today. <laughs> Sometimes the best trick is to just buy a product that makes your life easy. Right? It's about working hard. No, it's working smart, not hard, right? There we go. Well, that's about as consistent as you're ever going to get. Okay, so I'm just going to do this exactly until the very end. Wow, all of a sudden, there are people out there all over the country watching this going, I can't believe how much I paid my carpenter to do that. <laughs> if you're looking for a gig economy business to get into, um, you can build a small deck in a day and then you can do a privacy fence like this in an afternoon the next day That's uh, something to consider Because this This is one hell of a way to make a living. I have extras anyway That's still not gonna fit in. Oh. Still doesn't fit. Okay, so it's unanimous um, One vote and I made it uh, <laughs> alternating spaces of five and a half inch deck boards with a half inch space leaves me with this little bit of height left over. I'm not sure what everybody was thinking about, but I'm just going with double spacer, double spacer. Going to do it consistently across the board. That allows me to put my decorative cap on. To me, it's a win. If you have a different idea, or if you think it would be better to, to stop with this last board here and just not have that space. Interesting point is I'm five, ten and a half. I don't know why I count the half. 5'11 in shoes. Matt's a little over six foot, so with this board gone, he's looking right over the top of that as he's walking around. So, a lot of tall people in my family. So we're gonna opt to add the extra height so we actually have the privacy we're paying for here. That makes sense? Let me know in the comments section if you have a different opinion. So you can see, basically what happened here is we, we were just following up one space per board, nice and simple, just like it is in the picture on the package. But what happened is when we're using cedar, we get to the top and the wood was too high to put the decorative cap on. 
I was like, well, that was kind of stupid. So it became an issue. And it was going to be higher than the aluminum itself, about a half an inch higher. So we took it apart and came back and we went with a, a double stack system. So double stack, spacer double stack, and then that gives us a place where the, the cap can go in. Not really a big issue, I guess. It's just be, uh, it'd be nice if it was more consistent. But if I took the extra board off and added all the other spacers, this board only comes up to this high. And that's not as much privacy as we want back here. So we do, we do what we do. Just a real, real warning. If you're gonna go this tall and do the spacing system, while you're at the store buying your package, buy an extra package of spacers. They don't give you any more than what's necessary to get the boards to this height, okay? Step one, of course, is to give all of your deck boards and surfaces a light sanding. The reason for this is when they cut the wood at the mill, it's a rough surface and they make it clean by using a planing machine and it leaves a little bit of a glaze on the wood. And if you don't get rid of that glaze and scuff it up a little bit, it won't receive the, pr the stain properly. And you're gonna end up with a really weak finish. So quick light sanding, 220 orbital sander, just past the surface, that's all it is. And then we're gonna go to the next step. Next step, and I know you don't have to use a lot of pressure. We're wetting the wood, okay? Unless it needs to be washed and scrubbed, we're just getting it a good soak just before we put on our, our treatment. And the idea here is, when now that we've sanded it, we want, we want to open up the pores to receive the stain. And it's a hot day, and this is a little dirty. We just finished installing this privacy screen. And if you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link in the video description for you. This is a game changer. 20 feet of fence between you and your neighbors for 1600 bucks, and you can install it yourself. It was really easy. When you get them ready, you're doing surface prep for a stain job. The stain lasts a long time. So you gotta make sure that you wash it, scrub it, wash it, scrub it again if you need to. I don't care if you spend three weeks washing and scrubbing. Don't stain it until it's ready. Until you're completely satisfied it couldn't be in any better condition. Because this is the only shot that you get of making sure that you're not gonna get a little white line from a piece of grass that was laying there, right? Or you're gonna have dirt showing up. It gets compounded and magnified when the stain hits it. So just do your best. Don't be satisfied with footprints. <sighs> scrub, 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 scrub. <laughs> You'll be surprised at the stains you find in wood. Sometimes it's just a matter of somebody at the lumber yard was sitting down having lunch and spilled their drink. Here we go, so here's my stain rig. I got my can, my CO2 guard. This is the product we're using. It is a two application penetrating sealer with UV protection mixed in. And you gotta continually mix as you're working with it, okay? Now, so I took two cans, I poured most of the contents into the pail, kept a couple inches in there, used a paint mixer to stir up the gummy stuff on the bottom, put it all together, mix it again. It is a mixture, so as it sits, it starts to separate. I'll take the deck brush handle here. Ah, and we got two application techniques we're gonna go through real quick. One is brush. And we're gonna use this because we have control. And it's gonna be more like a painting process. We'll go through that in a second. Once the painting is done, I've got the same product split into this can here. Now this is a Scott's canister. It's designed for weed control, adding garden grow and all that kind of jazz, but it has a cool tip here. It's got three functions. So I'm using a fan function, okay? And I'm going to be applying the stain on all of my boards with this, right? And then, I'm going to take the handle off of this brush, thread the handle from my scrub brush on here, and I'm gonna use this because these bristles will act as a, how should we just some pressure to help push that product into the wood, all right? It is a hot day today, so uh, using that pressure is very important. 
and you want to make sure that every, about every three minutes you go back and you recoat what you just did. So you got to be careful you don't do too much flooring and then you're kind of walking on it, right? That's the problem. And remember, this stuff does not skin. It does not stay, stay on the surface of the wood. It penetrates into the wood. So let's say three, five years from now, we come back out in the spring. It's like, hey, it's a little dull. We'll get another can, we'll mix it up, and we'll just, we'll just spray the whole deck down. It'll take 20 minutes. Walk away, let it dry, and you're good for another five years. What a deal. Looks like it's almost dry. We're going to head over there and start brushing, and we're going to show you our system here. So the stain, it's, it's really watery, all right? Bring it over with the brush, apply it in, okay? Now this brush is designed to be as wide as the board, all right? Get the excess off with gentle pressure, all right? There we go, that's stained. If you have more control, just press the brush on the side, get a little extra content out of there. That's it. I'm only gonna do the top of the bench, obvious reasons, we're gonna demonstrate how to use that spray system. Now the reason I use the cardboard is because I don't wanna get drips on another piece of wood that I'm not gonna be staining for a little while, okay? So here we go. Now if you've got an old deck and you've got existing stain or paint and you can't just apply this on top, almost every other product on the market is not a penetrating sealer. You're gonna run into all kinds of trouble. Well, there's the top. Let's see if we can do the rest of this bench. Ah, with the canister. That's not bad. All right, I'm gonna hold up for a second because I wanna brush all that in, make sure that it penetrates. Wow, that just made that real easy. All right, well there we have it, folks. That is a, that's a gentle kind of pressure on that wand. It's not putting too much product on there at once. I'm just gonna rub it in nice and even. There we go, that's how you add the pressure. Here's the application. Don't be deceived, there's more product going on there than it looks like. But it gives you a really nice range of control here. <laughs> that looks pretty darn good actually. Give it a little bit of brush work. Get good penetration on this. Well, not happy there. A little bit more product. Wow. If this isn't the easiest looking stain job you've ever done in your life, I don't know what is. But this is awesome. <clears throat> I need a little more product over here. Bright sun, right? Okay. And that's our, that's our three minute mark. So now I'm gonna do this all over again. So if you're amazed at this product right now, like I am, you're gonna be asking yourself, where do I get it? The answer is not at Home Depot. C2 Guard is an exclusive formula for the C2 paint stores. And this is a, uh, a co-op all over North America. Now, we've made an available special discount for you guys. You can get this stuff delivered to your house in the United States, 20% off, okay? Whew. If you're in Canada, go to the website, look for a store near you. In Ottawa, all of my friends from Ottawa, go to Randall's Paints on Bank Street. All right, he'll hook you up. Ask for Mark, tell him Jeff sent you. So now you can see why when we built this privacy fence, we left the plastic on the aluminum. When we're all done, we'll just remove the plastic. Problem solved, right? Consider five years from now, all you do is throw some painter's tape on your aluminum, off you go to the races. Well, there you have it, guys. You can pay someone $5,600 to build you a fence, or you can DIY an entire deck for 6,000 and a little bit of blood, sweat, and tears. Fire Pit and Gazebo were extras, and if you want to see how I built those, you can click the link right here. Cheers.